And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? <laughs> yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fuck quit. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Spit and Chicklets. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 425 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney. For my friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family, what is shaking, everyone? Hope you had a nice week here. We had a busy week in the NHL. We got a new coach, a whole bunch of new All-Stars, a whole bunch of other shit to get to. But let's check in with the fellas first, like we usually do. Producer Mikey Grinelli. Missed you last week, buddy. How you doing, my friend? I miss you guys as well. Uh, yeah, tough week for the Grinnell family last week. We lost my amazing grandmother to cancer. So I uh, I appreciate the kind words from not only you guys, but all of Chicklets Nation. It uh, meant more than anyone will really ever know. But I'm happy to be back. I'm happy to talk some hockey today. But yeah, uh, appreciate you guys and appreciate Chicklets Nation uh, more than anyone will ever know. Fucking right, G. Well we said, G. G. We love you, buddy. Well said, buddy. Love you guys. Next up, mix it up. Go to the wit dog, Ryan Whitney. How we doing, my friend? How was your weekend? It was great. Uh, pretty low key. Uh, as I think we said last week, we, Biz and myself were heading down to Florida to shoot some Pink Whitney commercials. Um, two, to be exact. I don't think we're able to give away kind of the premise of, of each commercial, but two fun ones. I think they're going to turn out great. Uh, shout out to to Rob at, at Barstool, right? I mean, this guy directed them all. He ran the show. He knows what's up. And he was able to kind of figure out our humor and, 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 and make a great script along with Biz and some other people. So I mentioned on uh, McQuaid was down there with us filming. I mean, acting's a joke. Acting is way harder than people think. Now, granted, when I say acting, I probably had three total lines in two different commercials. But it's like it's just so difficult to turn it on and then take have all these takes. And I think the second commercial, we started at 6 p.m. and left around 2.15 a.m. That's a 30 second commercial. So um, <laughs> it, it's kind of a grind. But I think the final product will be hilarious. And by... Stanley Cup Finals. Once it once the commercial's been on for two and a half months, you guys will hate our, our guts again. Similar to <laughs> time for hire to shot from the first commercial almost four oh, years ago. So we're not on ice in this one. Um, so I won't give anything else away. But it, it was nice to get home, and I think we got a crazy month here coming up. We got All Star Scottsdale. I mean All Star Fort Lauderdale Scottsdale Super Bowl. I'm going skiing this week, shredding time. Actually, if you notice, we dropped some new merch. Grinelli out of the clouds. Uh, Whitney Ski Club which kind of cracked me up because like my ski club would probably be <laughs> like betting windows, house. pink Whitney, a golf simulator, like basically it'd be indoors. So I'm going to give it a go here this week up at Okemo and shred a little bit. So I'm looking forward to that. Nothing like pink Whitney nips on the mountain too, either wit. They're like the perfect mountain nip. Oh, they had a cameo in the commercials. That's all we're giving away though. Yeah, they did. They had a great cameo actually. Biz. Behind you, that's not your usual spot, Paul Biz Nasty Bissonette. Where are you and why are you there right now? I'm in Atlanta, I'm here a couple of days early for the TNT broadcast. I wasn't actually supposed to do this week following uh, uh, the commercial for Pink Whitney. He's supposed to get a little bit of rest, but obviously with talk getting hired by the Vancouver Canucks, they needed a couple of seats to be filled in throughout the rest of the year. So I will be on full grind mode uh, between the podcast uh, and TNT. Uh, going back to the, the commercials filmed, we were in Del Rey. Right, that's the area, Delray, yeah. Delray Beach. Very, very fun area down in Bumping. Florida. Uh, up and coming, Atlantic Ave. We saw a lot of Chicklets fans, so shout out to all the people who stopped us and said hello. Wait, you touched on it, Rob Langevin. Is that how you say his last name, Langevin? Oh yeah, I nailed it. He was a, a a rock for us. He battled through both of those commercials. Those are long days for him. We set we show up on set and we're there for like you know six, seven, eight hours, whatever it is, both days. He's there fucking two, three hours beforehand and probably an hour or two afterward getting everything not only set up, but then taking everything down. So everybody from the barstool side, all the extras who had to hang around, all the people who work on lighting, it, there's, a, there's a lot that goes to putting in the sauce. So uh, what's the saying? This, there's a lot that goes into making the sauce. Oh, yeah. Every, everybody's shrugging their shoulders like, what the fuck? <laughs> no, I got you on this? that. You guys know what saying I'm talking about. But with to start off that trip, it was funny. You had another airline story, which seems every oh. time you fly, something <laughs> happens on your I flight. I forgot about that guy. His fucking guy, man. He he was cracking me up. So why don't, I'll hand it back over to you for the story. Yeah, so I was flying Delta. Um, Delta's a great airline, in my opinion. I, I, I seem to have a lot of success in terms of um, 
flying there, getting your bags, just actually touching wheels down on time most of the time. But um, so I had a first class seat and I sat down and just an absolute, just a truck of a man, a unit. I, I, I said it was like Elio for anyone who knows Barstool, Elio, Mr. Ice showed out his new merch. Three plus three equals seven in terms of hitting the overs. He bets overs every night. The guy reminded me a lot of Elio, same size, monster unit, but he had a big old beard. So we get there and the guy, uh, no, it was a woman flight attendant. She said, can I get you guys a drink? I was like, no, I'm chilling. I wasn't going to have anything to drink. We, whatever. He's like, yeah, I'll do a Tito soda. Sure. No problem. One times it basically. She's like, can I get you one more? Now, mind you, we're still on the ground, but first class, they'll give you a couple before takeoff. He's like, yeah, I'll take another one. Dummies it. Two sipper. I'm like, this guy's an animal. Get up in the air. So as soon as they can give you a drink, he probably the, the woman probably helped him out even a little earlier. She's like, can I get you one more? Like, really nice. You know, and that's two in, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Gets the third. Gonzo. She gives him a fourth. So we're now... I'm going to say we've been in the air 40 minutes. We've probably been on the plane for like an hour. He hammers back the fourth. So once he finishes it, she's walking by. He says, excuse me, miss. Very polite. He says, can I get another one? She's like, sir, I'm sorry. Not right now. He's like, what? She's like, you've had four. We're like, the, the flight isn't even like <laughs> one eighth done. Like, he's like, are you kidding me? She's like, sir, I'll give you another one. Just, you know, wait a little bit. He's like, this is this is fucking bullshit. You know how much money I pay for this seat? This is fucking bullshit. And she's like, I'm sorry, sir. I'll help you out in a little bit. You're just going to have to wait a little bit. And he turns to me. He's like, can you believe this lady? I'm like, that's so <laughs> fucked up, man. I'm like, you want me to order you one? He's like, yeah, please. So she walked by like five minutes later. I'm like, excuse me, miss. Can I actually do a Tito soda? She's like, sure. So she gives it to me and I hand it over to him. He's like, thanks, bud. <laughs> Dude, she walked like right back behind. She didn't see me do it. But as she walked and saw, she's like, what are you doing? Like yells at me and then yells at him and takes the drink away. But he, he was like, Dum! and like hammered it before she could. So she's <laughs> giving it to me, giving it to him. He's like, you know what? Fuck you and fuck Delta. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> Dude, this guy was asleep in 20 seconds, <laughs> snoring his dick off. I actually got a great picture of him. I'm like this. I'm like, I texted my buddies what was going on. He was like, oh. but I really kind of thought I was being a good guy getting him the drink. She was pissed off at me. That's just a, a classic stir in the pot, though, when he's like, can you fucking believe this? Oh, shit? I, yeah, I man, just this wanted to get wrecked, <laughs> which which I mean, there's no chance he wasn't you, because you you want it to be the guy recording a video where, where a, a pedestrian is getting kicked off of an airline for being a dickhead in first class, didn't you? Yeah, you wanted kind of. you wanted to be the the Odell Beckham Jr. He was sequel. my Odell. He was my Odell. I was like, <laughs> I'm gonna make this guy get booted off this plane. <laughs> but then I started thinking, like, if I'm giving him booze, I guess I could somehow be held responsible. Actually, on the way home, I met a great guy too. He's a big time soccer agent. We had a great discussion. He was reading a FIFA packet, and he actually noticed, uh, like me, he's a big listener of Chicklets. So me and my and my soccer fandom, I asked him a million questions all the way home. It was it was two very entertaining jumps nice out of travel the downs for me. So he j jumped out of the exit two hours in. He's like, enough of this guy. Yeah, he's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm like, hey, you want a Tito soda? Trying to get the guy crippled. <laughs> hey, we're a fucking Pink Whitney New Amsterdam podcast. I'm I know they don't have it on Delta. They don't have Pink Whitney on any airline. That should be like a thing for New Amsterdam to get maybe involved. Oh, you, we, we would fit in perfect with spirit. I was just going to say we should get on spirit or frontier. I mean, it is a spirit. It hey, they way, drop right? off a full 40. Just fucking here. Go have at it. Yeah, I have some. Yeah, you need a spirit to fly freaking spirit. Need a, need a handle um, of fucking pink with me. Ton, tons of laughs down there. I mean, uh, Nick Turney was in, in one of the commercials as well. One of the funniest guys at Barstool. Not only does he do, do his own stuff, he helps write for other people. I won't divulge which shows because I don't want to throw guys under the bus, bus for their lack of humor, although I might start using them. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> after the, the shoot, though, on Saturday, I ended up going to spend a few days with Keith Yandel. So the laughs didn't stop. And I tell you what, laughter it's medicine, guys. And and hanging around with Keith and a guy that I played with for five years, it was such a blast. Uh, we ended up going golfing, hanging out with his local buddies. So uh, I'm a little bit hurting. Definitely had some cocktails, but back in the saddle here in Atlanta, ready to go talk some hockey. A couple of big stories broke just after we recorded last week. So I know we're going to have to hop into them pretty soon here. But all hey, in all, uh, boys, Nick, 
we quickly before we go, Nick, um, we had a nice hot stove that that commercial Friday night. It didn't end. We didn't get back to the hotel till like two thirty, two forty five. But um, me, you, and Nick and Quater, we couldn't just shut her down. We're like, let's just have a beer or two in the room. And we were shooting the shit. One of the things that cracked me up. I don't know how Facebook came up. Like, I don't know how I was like, do you still have Facebook? Nikki goes, yeah. The only reason I have it, though, is to see the kids I went to high school with get arrested. <laughs> just to see, something like that. Well, like, just what? we've talked about it before. He's originally from Wheeling, West Virginia. So there's not a lot going on there other than, of course, some chaos uh, for, for his buddies who probably find themselves getting into trouble week in and week out so uh oh my god is he a funny fucking bastard though he had me dying laughing the whole time well biz we already mentioned why why you're in atlanta already huge news over the weekend it's been a long time coming one of the strangest and probably most disrespectful things we've ever seen in the league the canucks they let bruce boudreau twist in the wind uh they finally let him go they hired rick talk and named him the coach on sunday he's the 21st head coach in franchise history the third in the last 13 months they're paying Bruce Boudreau, two million. Travis Green, two point seven five million. And weeks he reported that uh, talk signed a three year deal in the two two point seven five million dollar range. Adam Foot will be an assistant. Sergey Gonchar is going to be the defensive development coach. But I don't think I've ever seen a fan base this angry at an organization oh. the way they've handled this whole thing from soup to nuts. What you talked about it last week, you had a big tweet about it. But they're fucking irate right now. Biz, we'll go to you first. They're paying <laughs> Travis Green still. Oh yeah, dude. Oh my God. It, it, dude how about he's making 750 grand more than Bruce Boudreau? That, that's what caught me off guard. I think that was Green's second or third job. Bruce has been around. Well, they, no, years. they had the season, though, where they ended up going a second round of playoffs. I, I want to say it was after the in the bubble. They ended up upsetting somebody in the first five games, winning the first round, and then going off the second. So maybe he was re signed after that. But when, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to what you said last week. I wasn't as hard on the Canucks because I felt like it was this built-up thing and everybody was aware of it. Then you started seeing the clips where I, I guess more and more news was breaking that he was going to be canned and they were finalizing a candidate, which was talk. And obviously things took longer probably than expected given the fact that he had the TNT job and and just you know picking the right candidate, of course, too. But all right, you said it. Like, this is... It, this was like so brutal for Bruce Boudreaux and such a likable guy. Like a bunch of his former uh, former players were interviewed about it. Like Andrew Cogliano was asked about it. He said he doesn't deserve this. I love Bruce. He was huge in my development. Incredible coach. So I I would have to agree where the 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 fan base in Vancouver has seen enough through the years to be irate. And there was a situation with Trevor Linden. When he was there, when I think that he was very adamant that the team go through a full rebuild build and tank and get really bad in order to rebuild and, and get back to their, their glory days when they fucking went to the finals against Boston. I think that ownership just refused to do it. And they, Accolini has his hands in, 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 in all over it, basically. To the point where it does fuck with what guys in charge want to do. And, and it just has led to to now even more hatred, more so than I can believe. Wit, like, have you seen have you seen an ownership group more hated than this in in your time being alive? Oh, I don't know. I, I I I've never seen anything like this since I got into pro hockey. I I I mean the whole situation as one. Like the ownership. Now let me say this: I owe a big apology to the Vancouver Canuck fan base because. I said last week, I don't know exactly how I worded it. Maybe half the fans want to rebuild, half them don't. More than half, yeah. I must have I must have gotten a thousand messages. Like a very crazy fan base that I've called out before as being toxic and maybe a little painful, but I'll re I'll rephrase. I think they all wanted to rebuild. I think they still all want to rebuild. And I totally misspoke from a fan base who's sick and tired of middling along the middle of the road. Did that make sense? Is it middling along? All right. I like it. We're going to roll. It can't be today. Yeah, I guess. Middling along in just (laughs) obscurity, just like no man's land, just flyers land of all those years of finishing just so so. And so now you see like not only not only do, do have fans wanted a, a rebuild and a full tear down for a while. Well, all of a sudden this year, you had the possible chance to make it happen with the Vancouver kid Bedard coming around, not Vancouver, but BC kid coming. And they still like the JT Miller signing the, the Besser resigning the, the the decision to not give Horvat a contract. Like if you're going to resign one guy, why isn't it Horvat? 
And so there's all these things that have happened with this organization over these years where people have been like, tear it down and start over. And then it all ends up with just disrespecting a guy who's been a big part of the NHL for fucking 25 years, it seems like coaching in Bruce Boudreaux. So the fans have a right to be furious. And I've been so hard on Rutherford. Now, mind you, like Alvin is is what kind of job does he have? When you remember, if you remember Brian Burke being the president of hockey in Calgary, Tree Living was still making the decisions. This Alvin doesn't do anything. And, and it's I'm not even chirping him. Rutherford's just like, all right, I'll hire this guy, but I'm still going to make every decision. And as hard as I've been on Rutherford and this guy, I mean, look at what he's accomplished. Three Stanley Cups. He's done it all. He's been successful everywhere he's gone. And I've been hard on him. But the more I hear rumblings, I think he might have actually fired Boudreaux. It was this idiot owner. This owner is despised. Oh, my God. And it's not just about the Boudreaux decision. And it's not just about the rebuild. It's about all these messages I'm getting. And take it for what it's worth. People could be lying to me. But when you hear it enough, I don't think they are. It sounds like this guy treats people like shit. And all you want is somebody to treat their employees and to treat people around their 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 businesses, whether it's hockey related or not. You just want them to treat them well. And this guy sounds like he treats everyone like complete shit. So it, it kind of makes sense when you see what they did with Boudreaux and they and you see how things have gone. It's like you look to the top, you look to ownership. And when there's a failure, you have to end up blaming the guy that's in charge of it all. So fans are disgusted and biz your original question that I've rambled on. I don't no, remember no, seeing an NHL. I don't remember seeing an NHL owner hated by their fans this much. I really don't. RA, if you have anything in mind, I don't know. No, I can't recall it. Anything similar to this uh, where a guy had to sit, sit there. I mean, he thought he was getting fired in November. Brudeau said it himself. And have you ever heard a coach name his who his predecessor is going to be uh, the guy after him? He says, oh, I think it's going to be talking. That was maybe the strangest thing I ever heard. Brudeau saying who's coming in after before it was well, officially not only announced. that. All right. He's like, he, he even said, he's like, they, they pretty much teed it up for when the, the, the tough part of the schedule, like he Boudreau finally started speaking up and I wouldn't say taking shots back, but just being open and honest about how maybe as big of a gong show as it got. And in the press conference, Rutherford did comment about how he probably went too yeah. hard in on Boudreau, which, you know, definitely media wise where you could have pulled them pulled him over and said this but you know if i guess if a coach is maybe coming into training camp a little bit unprepared but maybe he's the type of coach where he eases in the seat into the season and gets a feeling for his players and i i think the i think the it's always been the case of where he lets him play a little bit i don't pond hockey ain't the word but just free-flowing right lack of structure lack of systems and i could see where you know a, a, a gm or a president with championship pedigree where that would frustrate him, frustrate him day in and day out where he's not seeing the hands on work with the individual players that they are going to be keeping in the organization and seeing any form of, of growth instead it it was kind of a you know it's a results league too right he's Boudreaux's trying to win games rolling out your best players 23 24 minutes every night in my opinion what it's going to do is it's going to create bad habits especially in that playing the pawn hockey style where you know defensively you're, you're you're throwing turnovers you're missing assignments this and that so the the going back to last week and we said it and i was like couldn't they just have fired him and had an assistant take over like yosey's been a head coach before he's there you're still going to end up paying boudreaux his full salary so to drag it out and and make it in an embarrassing situation for him given with how much he was liked by the fan base and how how psycho they tend to be in their feelings about stuff and that's not an insult they care about the organization no, they're passionate they're pa they're passionate people so with that now you get the backlash and i don't know i don't this isn't just going to go away either and the worst part about it and guys i love talk and i'm happy for him and i think he's going to be a successful coach with the vancouver canucks it puts him in a horrible situation i know and like it's no, not his fault. It, it, but, it could have been Scotty Bowman himself stepping in there. Yeah. And, and it was it, a talk. I don't know. Some people saying that he might even get booed his first game where it's like, what the fuck did he have to do with this? He was waiting to make a decision on seeing if it was the right fit for him and just an overall shit show. But do you, you have anything else to say on the situation? An overall was, shit show is the perfect way to describe it. And it, it is unfair to talk like this guy's getting a chance to be an NHL head coach again. I think he's going to be great. And you've become real close to him. But in my time with talk, what a great guy. And now he's going into this hornet's nest of fans, which I hope fans are smart enough 
You can't take the hatred out on talk. He's done nothing wrong. And he was pretty open. Also, I wanted to bring up Rutherford. Um, he kind of said, listen, my whole career, I've been really honest, which is a good thing, especially for guys like us and media members, gives the stuff to talk about. But he said, I got to zip it a little bit. And, and a lot of times I just spoke so freely and open with how I felt throughout this season and throughout how this this year began with Bruce. And I, and I wish I could take that back. He said they're friends. I, I don't know if they'll still be friends, but he kind of took a little ownership in fa- in terms of like, I probably shouldn't have been speaking about certain things the way I did in terms of like around camp and all that other stuff. One positive out of this is that Boudreau ended up getting a pretty special send off. And you saw him at the end, uh, the last game, crazy amount of cheers, the horrible Bruce. There it is, champ. But at mm. least he got to I think he got pretty teary out of the bench, too, because he's 68 years old. I don't think he'll be a head coach again in the league. And so to get a good buy like that, if you're going to look at all this bullshit that's happened in terms of how he finally got fired, if it was a quick one uh, right after a loss on the road, you don't really get to experience all the love from the fans. And in terms in a case where a guy's probably never going to coach in the NHL again, it's nice to get a send off like that. You could tell it meant a lot to him. So, um, yeah, it was just it was it was a horrible way to handle things. I think for a long time uh, it'll be looked at and discussed as maybe the worst way to fire a guy in NHL history. Is that crazy to say? Um, so. Bruce Boudreaux, what a run you've had. Congrats on all the success you did have. You didn't you didn't deserve to go out like that, but I'm glad he got to to feel the love from the fan base his yeah. final game. And on the flip side of that, guys, uh, you know, we WBD, Turner, TNT, whatever you want to call it, the broadcast loses uh, a great one in, yeah. in Rick Taka. You mentioned becoming friends with him uh, very closely over the last two years. Uh, what a professional. He was so passionate about the broadcast and, and allowed us to to view things through a different lens too. Like every time a play would happen, he would have the coach's hat on and see it through the the, the poor defensive play. And, you know, we'd get to Josh back and forth about structure and, and positioning and, and, you know, how what he, what he would have done differently. And, you know, sometimes we'd even argue in the back about how we want to present it on air, but not for, you know, not for a lack of friendship or lack of passion. You know what I'm saying? It was all because he wanted to teach and, and you could tell he still had the itch to coach. And I'm really happy that he found a great situation with a guy that he's won two Stanley Cups for or with before uh, in, in Rutherford and Pittsburgh. Right. He was he was the assistant coach there. So to have a guy that you can work with that you have in the past to to get Vancouver, hopefully back to their winning ways. It'll be cool. I'm really happy for him, but I'm in the same same breath, uh, very sad that uh, we, we've lost him. So that seat is now open. I think Hank's going to be in a little bit more. I think Yans is going to be in a little bit more. They need you and Yans on together. That's, that would, hasn't happened yet, and I think that could be big time. I'm I'm looking forward to it. It's going to happen at some point. I'm not sure who else they have planning on coming in. Maybe Jonesy for a couple. So uh, right now it's going to be a, a mixed bag of nuts, but looking forward to, to adapting and keeping rolling with the punch because this year, man, TNT's got the Stanley Cup Finals, so we gotta we gotta make up for a tough loss. Biz, any funny stories from talk from behind the scenes at TNT that you want to tell us? I told the one about when we were arguing about a defensive play it, at TNT, like we were and there. Sullivan was dogging you in Pittsburgh too. He he said I was wrong about it, which I, you know I was maybe it was the old school way of communicating when I was defenseman, where I pointed to the guy that I wanted the back checker to take, and he says you don't fucking do that. So we kind of got in a heated debate, and then we ended up showing up to the hotel after, and you know he he ended up pulling up the clip again, and then sure as shit we ended up arguing for another thirty minutes at 1 30 in the morning outside of people's hotel rooms on the on the 17th floor of uh, of the four seasons so uh just shit like that but no just uh just it was awesome just hearing about the the, the old school stories in the old days of how how things went and you know not 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 leaving the the right after the game and and you know you're staying in town so a lot of which i can't share on here g a lot a, a lot of laughs of stories that will be kept in the vault but uh you know, just being able to to enjoy stories from him and Wayne together was, uh, you know, a, a situation where you just shut your mouth and listen, and you're just in awe about the fact that uh, you get to listen to two legends. Hey, Whit, uh, do you think this will be an actual deterrent to guys going to Vancouver? Like, is that just kind of things, no? Things um, people are saying it's still money, it's still Vancouver, right? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think in the end, it's, it's you can't, you can't gas a player that way. Although I guess you could, you know, let everyone know you're going to trade a guy, and then 
it's just different. Like there's no situation like what happened with Boudreaux that could kind of happen to a player, at least not that I can think of right now. Uh, it's going to be different, though, because guy, guys knew the entire time. Like, all right, I don't think Boudreaux is going to be here. Guys know what's going on. And now talk comes in. It's like, all right, this is the guy. So I better start playing um, in terms of like this guy's not going anywhere. So talk was very open in his first press conference. I think he might have mentioned Miller in terms of like needing more out of him and getting back to the player he was last year. And he also mentioned how much ice time guys had and, and not maybe having these star players, Pedersen, et cetera, killing penalties. So there's going to be a lot of different differences happening. Adam Foote, what a decision that is to bring him in. And Sergey Gonchar, who, I mean, talk about a hockey mind. Yeah. Uh, he is so smart with the details and the little things. And he's he's so good at, uh, even playing with him, he's so good at describing what he needs from you and, and looking at things that maybe a player wouldn't see. And a guy who played long enough as a great defenseman can kind of teach you. So I think the team uh, is going to show improvement. I don't know what's going to be the deal in terms of the Horvat trade. He's going to be gone. I don't know if they're going to look to move other guys and try to actually rebuild. Nobody knows what's going to happen now. But they do know, at least for the fan base and the players, this this entire ordeal is over with and they can kind of start anew. Uh, one other thing that Talk mentioned was a- adapting more conversation with the players and getting to know the, the personnel, you know, whether it's grabbing them for a cup of coffee 10 minutes before practice and just keeping in touch with all of them to see how they're doing on a personal level, because there has to have been some form of adaptation over time and how you interact with the players like the tough love is cool and all. But there has to be a fine line of balance with that, with how this just the next generation, they how they are. It's just if you and if you don't adapt, you're going to be out of the league. So he he mentioned that that was one of his priorities coming in and, and making sure he establishes the relationships uh, with the people, not just the players. Right. Well said. Well said, Biz. OK, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Pink Whitney. Man, it's the middle of the winter time. You need a few cocktails. You want to huddle to a local bar. Make sure you grab yourself from Pink Whitney, the pink lemonade flavored vodka from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka. Grinelli, I know what you like this stuff. Spring, winter, fall, whatever. You you loaded up on this stuff or what this time? Of course, I'm loaded up on this stuff. All right. It's ski season. It's Apre ski season. There's no better Apre ski drink than a little Pink Whitney nip. You're on the ski lift. You're heading up there. Boom. Pound a nip. Uh, like like you said, winter, fall, summer, it doesn't matter. Pink Whitney is the best drink on the market, but it doesn't get any better than a little Pink Whitney on the ski hill. I'll tell you that. No doubt. No doubt. Also get some big football games next week and you might want to stock up for those. And of course, hockey. It's always hockey season, which means you want some Pink Whitney. So order a shot of Pink Whitney at your local bar. Get it with a little mixer. Either way, enjoy some of that fine Pink Whitney. Uh, we hadn't actually mentioned that guest yet. We're not bringing him on right now, a little bit later. Big Z, Zidane Char. We told you before we sat down with him in Boston for about an hour and a half, so we got that coming up a little bit later. Just want to throw that out there. Um, the other big story of the week, uh, last Tuesday, uh, Flyers defenseman Ivan Provorov, he skipped warm-ups versus Anaheim because he didn't want to don the Pride Night jersey that the uh, Flyers are wearing. Had the rainbow number and, and the rainbow nameplates. He cited his religion as the reason he became the first NHL to opt out of wearing the rainbow for 15 minutes to essentially give a shout out to LGBT fans. Uh, he said, quote, I respect everybody. I respect everybody's choices. My choice is to stay true to myself, and my religion. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, Provorov is Russian Orthodox, which does not perform or recognize same sex marriages. And the head guy in charge over there, he supports all the anti-gay legislation in Russia. Uh, Coach John Tortorella said Provy did nothing wrong. Just because you don't agree with his decision doesn't mean he did anything wrong. Why would I bench him? Because of a decision he's making based on his beliefs and his religion. It turned out to be a great night for Pride Night. It was a whole hullabaloo in the media. I think the media made more of it than maybe actual people in real life did. Uh, you heard EJ Raddick uh, with a pretty outrageous suggestion. They say he should go back to Russia and maybe take up arms in the invasion of Ukraine, which I thought was crazy because the guy who brought Provorov over here was a Ukrainian who actually was his translator for a few years. So he was way off base saying that. And on the other side of the coin, his jersey did sell out in a day to probably people who never heard of the guy before. So they were maybe supporting him for that particular reason. But uh, kind of a weird couple of days. Also, uh, what did you know? You can still get Keith Yandel's jersey for $175 on the Flyers site. I thought oh, that was kind shit. of funny. They're, they're still asking that much for, for the guy. But anyways, what, what was your take on the whole thing? And uh, it was you know kind of a, a shitty couple of days for hockey, I think. Yeah, I mean, not 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 an ideal or, or fun topic to discuss, I would say. But with it being news, we must. And I got I got two sides. I mean, I got two sides. And, I, and I'll say I think most people, most normal people 
kind of agree with me. Um, the first being, if I'm pro from, I'm wearing that jersey, not just because I support anyone's right to enjoy the game and want to be a hockey fan and take part in, take part in being an NHL fan, but because it's just, it's what your team's doing, right? And I would have worn it and every other guy but him did wear it. And so it's a little selfish in my mind to sit there and say, no, all right, you make that decision. I don't agree with you. No other guys around the league that have worn those jerseys agreed with you, but it's your decision. The other side of it is if I'm looking at this, it's like every other guy wore the jersey and every other guy was willing to support any group, any person that wants to be an NHL fan or be a hockey fan or want to play hockey themselves. So the real story to me is how far the league has come. And I've seen this said a bunch of different places in the, in the sense that this would never have happened before. And now we have teams honoring any person out there, anyone in the world who wants to, who wants to watch the game. You have a place, you have a place. We, we want you as a fan, no matter who you are. And all these guys are supporting this. And I know Scott Lawton, I, I think his brother's gay and, and him and Van, Van Riemsdyk met with a bunch of the people that were at the game to take in part with the festivities. And it's a great thing. And there's all these good things happening for different groups that have never felt like they were included in being an NHL fan. And now they are. And it's getting better and better. But the story becomes this one guy. This one fucking guy decides not to wear the jersey and the, and the world explodes. The Twitter world. Okay. Whereas I look at it like, I think this game's come a long way. I think this game's going to continue to come a long way. And no matter who you are, what you believe in, you have a place in this game. So this one guy who decides to make this decision, it's like, all right, well, fuck him. It's like, oh, I mean, you, you know what? If I look at this, I think, I, I think when I see all these people in this jersey warming up, that's a great thing. And and like, all right, I don't even think anyone would have noticed if the, it wasn't turned into this enormous story. And it's kind of hard to get get your words across in, in something so sensitive to so many people. And I understand that. But like, all right, one guy didn't wear the fucking jersey. Like, I don't know. What, what, do, do, do people out there really think every single person is going to agree with them on any single topic involved with being fans of the NHL? What what are you what planet are you living on if you think every single guy is going to conform to your beliefs whether the beliefs are completely right or incorrect like people make up their mind on every subject and every topic in the world and for some reason the hockey world thinks every single guy has to completely agree with this if you don't i don't agree with you but it's your decision i i, I don't understand how this wasn't looked at like all right if the whole team's doing it and you know what that sucks there's one guy hopefully he changes his mind but every other guy was down with it yeah, it was disappointing that all the attention went to the to the negative aspect. And I just I just don't understand it where like if if you're if you're a, a you know a check mark or or a reporter and you have an issue with it, maybe go down to the locker room and have a conversation with the guy instead of dragging his name through the mud online and saying he should be you know sent back to Russia or he should be suspended or shouldn't. It's like why? Because he because he because he doesn't agree with you. Every single guy on this podcast right here too would believes in same sex marriage. We all support exactly what the league is doing, and for the reasons of guys like going back. I mean, even to to, to now, like like there are people in the gay community who suffer for like you know. There's people who pull out violent attacks on them because they don't agree with it, right? So they are oppressed to a certain degree. So the league is taking a stand and saying, we support this. We want this community involved in our sport. And I love it. And, and, and I think it's a good thing. So now this, all of a sudden, this one guy, and keep in mind, Provorov, guys, he, he, he knows two things pretty much. It's his religion and hockey. I don't think he... He's probably never hung around with gay people. He's probably doesn't have the type of world skills that most people who are typing online, who are criticizing him for it have gone through. So it's so, Bane Pettinger said it best. He goes, this is not a step back for what we're trying to do and, and, and what the league is trying to represent. It is disappointing. And the reason it's disappointing is because it's created so much division online to all these people arguing and taking the focus as to what's important. Like I have, I mean, I'm friends with Bane Pettinger and I think that most people listening and you talk uh, with about the people who like more, most normal people. I think most normal people saw this as a nothing burger story in the sense of, yes, one guy doesn't believe that, that gay people should get married. Well, as much as we could all disagree with him, we don't think that he should be sent back to Russia or have faced any fucking punishment. 
And some of the best times of my life have been hanging around with fucking gay friends. Like, I don't care at the end of the night who Bane Pettinger goes home with. I don't care who who my my guy friend gets married to. There's no weight on on my life and, and how my life is going to play out. So I don't understand why anyone would care. And I think that's probably where most people sit. I don't know why people would have such a strong opinion on either side. So. Uh, Ari, I could throw it back over to you. Where you you touched on most of it. Uh, it was obviously a, a tough week for for hockey with the Brujo situation playing out, and then this thing playing out online. So it got pretty ugly. Yeah, because I thought you know basically uh, Gary Bettman's statement and the NHL statement were, were pretty level headed. They were they were kind of like okay, you know, players are free to decide which initiatives they want to support or not. And and I think with, with the what they were kind of saying between the lines is like, hey, now you can have an opinion on that guy. He didn't want to skate. He became the first guy to want to skate with you know rainbow on his jersey. So you know you can think what you want of him, but we're not going to force somebody to feel a certain way. And I thought they conveyed that point pretty well. Like okay, you you know where a guy stands basically, and and you can't really force somebody to to feel that way. Yeah, I thought it was it was pretty pretty overblown as well and uh, you know they raised a ton of money for charity and what you already uh, get praised JVR and Scott Lott and those were the guys who put it together it didn't come from the team it came from those players and I'll also say Biz I can't imagine that Pro Rub was the first guy who was reluctant to do this I would think over the however many years they've been doing Pride Nights I'm sure there were probably guys who did it maybe feel the same way as Pro Rub but they didn't want to rock the boat team wise and they, you know they just put the jersey on so you know, he doesn't deserve to, to be shipped back to his home country and, and forced into war. And, you know, he I don't think he should be put on a pedestal either. It's just uh, it's just this day and age. Something when you like say the pedestal, you mean as far as like his jersey selling yeah. out where all of a sudden, if you don't know who the guy is and you go buy his jersey, I guess maybe there's a handful of people that bought it because he had the balls to, to stand up for what he, he he didn't believe in. But in the same breath, it's like, are, are those just the lunatics on the other side stirring it up just like the lunatics on the other side are? Yeah, it just, you know, you you didn't know who the guy was a day before. Now you heard he doesn't want to, you know, I guess, support the, that community. So that you, you got to buy a shirt to support that. So, you know, not a reason I would buy a shirt, but I don't know, free country, whatever you want. That's what you just want to spend your money on. Uh, this was another thing I had a question on. Now, I didn't realize skipping warm-ups was, was an option business. That's Is that a standard thing? A guy can set out warm-ups maybe if he was tired or I've that, never that was heard the one of it. Yeah, that's the one question. I, I had a guy, a guy begging off uh, of warm ups. I mean, you see sometimes guys go go on and then come off right away. As far as skipping it outright, no, I've never I've never seen a guy just skip warm up and then play in the game. I think that's what made it so obvious, and then why people started kicking up dust. Hey, and 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 I'll go go on to say this: I don't think the Flyers organization handled this properly. That's just flat out. They, 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 if they would have handled it a little bit more properly, I don't think that this thing would have been overblown. Maybe, guy. Hey, hey I, I would say the season's probably a wash. I would maybe say, hey, do do we sit the guy, this guy, out tonight? Maybe, maybe say he had an injury or something that he was attending to. Like, I, I don't know, man. Like, just would do you agree or disagree with that they could have handled this a little bit better? Um, yeah, but it's kind of a tough one because, like, it, it's it's what it's what this guy believes in. I mean, I don't agree with it, but it, it, Tortorella was getting absolutely raked over the coals. I. He's sitting there. He's like, yeah, I, I, he doesn't believe in it. It's his religion. I don't really know what you want me to say. I guess they could have done some things different. But so one of the things they they try to use against torts in which he since R.A. And I want to say you might even have the quote uh, as to where he said I was wrong about my comments. were saying that if any of my players kneeled for the American National Anthem, he would have kicked them off the bench and sat them out. So. So reporters asked him about the situation of him saying that. And and now all of a sudden somebody's making a stand and now all of a sudden you're okay with it. So he walked back those comments saying that he wasn't educated enough to comment on that at that time and that he regrets saying what he said. So in that situation, uh, yeah, that's all. That's all I got for that one. Uh, actually, involved in all this reminded me of, of a funny story. And Ned Haven, one of my good friends, his dad was uh, was a state senator for a long time. And and he was somebody who backed gay marriage. I believe R.A., correct me if I'm wrong, Massachusetts was the first state to legalize gay marriage or one of them. I think, yeah, I wasn't sure if it was massive of them all, but it was de okay, massive. So, definitely so I am right, right near the top. And, and, you know, he was he was a part of believing in that, which, as as Biz mentioned, all of us believe, like marry anyone you want. So Ned has a, a hilarious story about his dad. He's speaking at, at the senator wherever he, wherever he was. And I'll just read. He says, um, I've, I've had a lot of my friends and former teammates reach out to me and, and they've mentioned that they're having a tough time with the se sexual aspect of gay marriage. So I assured them that we should certainly encourage them to get married then because we all know there's no sex after marriage. 
<laughs> so Ned said, Ned said his mom wasn't exactly thrilled was thrilled with that one, but just a hilarious line and it's something that is just like such a such a joke. If you actually are that upset that two people are getting married, like fucking get over yourself, marry who you want, live with who you want, be a hockey fan. I hope everyone thinks they can be. And and in the end, none of these nights, none of these pride nights, none of these nights helping groups that have never felt comfortable within the NHL. None of none of this stuff happened years ago. And it's happening now. So we're on the right path. I truly believe that. And um, let's move onward and upward, right? Onward to fun hockey talk. And uh, congratulations to our pal Steven Stamkos. He scored his 500th goal, then added two more in a 5-2 win over Vancouver the other night. He's the third active player after Ovi and Sid to hit the number 500. He thanked his teammates in the interviews and then in the locker room. I thought it was pretty cool. Coop brought in the, uh, the equipment guy and the trainer who have been around for all 500 of his goals. Pretty nice gesture to kind of give a little spotlight to those guys. And uh, Mike McKenna, another guest of the show, he wrote a column saying basically that uh, Stan Coach was Stevie Y 2.0. I wonder, I wonder if you agreed with that, Biz. I didn't get to watch enough of Stevie Y play to 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 be able to make that. Like, wait, where, I mean, you, that was your favorite player growing up. I, I, I would tend to lean to say no. Yeah, I don't I, I don't necessarily see that. I know Eisenman is kind of known as like 150 points superstar offensively and then changed his game a little bit when they started winning cups in, in terms of kind of sacrificing some points for the greater good of the team and defensively. I think Stamkos has always been been really reliable at both ends of the ice and his stats have pretty, stayed pretty consistent. 90 point guy. I think he had 100 points one year. So I don't I don't really see that. I, I surely respect McKenna's opinion. He's got some great takes in terms of hockey and goaltending yeah. and everything. I, I don't I don't know where he came, came from on that one, but I, I was just so pumped for Stamkos. I got to know him. Just a little bit in the lockout. Uh, we did some lockout camps the year half the season was canceled. And once in fail, played golf with him a couple times. Just a great guy, like a, a true guy's guy. Everyone loves having him around a hell of a teammate. And his career has been so incredible to me. Just the, the adversity he's dealt with and battling back from injuries. Remember, this guy would have had 500 a lot sooner had, not, had he not dealt with some pretty significant brutal injuries. One cost him to miss the Olympics. You remember the broken leg in Boston. Uh, coming back and scoring that goal in the cup finals where he, he then wasn't able to participate in the rest of it in the bubble when they got their first cup. And this guy scored some all-time great goals. I mean, you think back to the um, the one where he's laying down and he knocks it out of midair in Anaheim. That was one of the best ones. Uh, he got both goals last year in game six in the clincher in a 2-1 win over the Rangers. I think the second one was about 10 seconds after Petrano had tied the game up in Tampa. He's had such a dynamic career. I mean, this is a first ballot Hall of Famer, one of the greatest players of his generation that uh, Coop actually mentioned. He's a generational talent. And just like the way he approaches the game and his teammates, it's somebody that's so easy to root for. And man, you look at Ovi, you look at Stammer, and, and and you know Tage Thompson and Pasta now, but top of the circle, power play. Holy shit! I mean that that that's what you'll always think of is, is Stammer spot. And so it's just a career that's that's so impressive. Not only with the cups and the accolades and the sixty goals one season. I think just him and Matthews and Ovi are the the three to the three to do that in the last what 30, 40 years. It seems like it's the injuries and the battling back from that that is been so impressive to me and it was only a matter of time till this guy got 500 and i think he'll probably get 600 too Woo! You think i he's mean gonna he's, be got, he's already what is he has three more since i mean he's not going anywhere soon yeah so. that's true the way he trains in the off season with uh gary roberts fucking protein shakes oh <laughs> grilled chicken no carbs just healthy as shit bio steel no pink whitney no big deal brewing kale shits oh God, yeah. <laughs> Sweet Biz, potatoes. Biz, did you, did you want to uh, add anything or jump in there? And I couldn't talk. No, you, you touched on it. I, yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's just an unbelievable career. And like at some points, there was talks of maybe he was going to be on the way out in, in Tampa. Yeah. Just based on the salary cap and where it was going. And you talked about those injuries and all the adversities came back from just a, a true professional. Now he's in the acting game. Fucking, he's the he's coming out. That's with a great commercial, actually. A great commercial. So he's gonna, yeah, he's he's probably got a few more left years left in the tank. Wit, and I wouldn't be surprised if he actually gets six hundred. You're right. Yeah, hell of a career he's had so far. Would be surprised me if he gets to another final after he's already been to four of them. So uh, those are pretty good scene of warmups the other night. Biz, uh, tampered Edmonton game uh, during the warmups. Pat Maroon summoned 
Van Kane over for a chat, but we couldn't hear the audio. But assuming he was, I don't want to say apologizing, but it was Maroon Skate who accidentally cut cut Kane, put him on the DL for a while. But they had like looked like a pretty conversation. I think it conveyed, you know, the respect that these guys have for each other. That you know, they're about to do battle. Maroon calls him over, has a chat, but then of course during the game, Maroon fucking. Wax fucking McDavis foot from underneath them, gives him a little crack after, ends up fighting that kid, Clint Cost. And so it ended up, you know, going right back to that aspect of hockey. I thought it kind of showed the, the whole world of hockey there in, in a few in a few short minutes. Klim Dross? Klim Dross. Uh, <laughs> no, no, great moment. Uh, you know, obviously th- those guys compete, shift shift in and shift out when they're when they're on the ice together, uh, no matter what game it is. But when something like that happens, it's pretty even when it ended up having happened in the original injury, you saw Patty Maroon waving for the trainer. So nobody likes to see that shit. And uh, a great tummy sticks moment uh, at the beginning of the uh, beginning of the warm up to see them chum it up. But uh, no friends out there when the puck drops. I'll tell you. No, that. And um, such an inadvertent thing. Like there's no chance anything was on purpose. So it was good to see. And and for for uh, people who have called me out, um, I mentioned last year, I think if I, I don't know what I said, if Kane got done when he came to the Oilers, I'd get his jersey. Well. No shit. Wow. An authentic Evander Kane, Royal Blue Home Oilers jersey. And I'll tell you right now, the Edmonton Oilers are buzzing. I, I yes, think as as of recording time, they're three points out of the top spot in the West. Um, as business Calgary Flames just flounder and their coach makes fun of a rookie for playing his first game and not doing anything, Ugh. the Edmonton Oilers just win and win and win. And McLeod looks good. These young guys are coming. Kane's back. Heads up. Heads the fuck up in E-Town, baby. Because Six in a row. Turn- it's an 82-game season. You don't have to light it up the entire time like the Bruins. The Oilers are peaking at the right moment, and I wouldn't be surprised to see them win the Pacific Division. I agree. What a bad scene that was with with Sutter kind of just. Yeah, and for people who don't know, um, we're going to have to we play the clip right now. Play the clip. What did you think of Jacob's first few shifts in the NHL? Uh, he compelled Jay. What number is he? 49. 49. <laughs> Six minutes, 35 seconds, 13 shifts, average 30 seconds a shift, got 43 seconds in the power play, played five minutes, 52 seconds, had one shot and goal and one hit. Beyond the stats. What you learn just from being on the bench and seeing what the veterans on the team are doing? It's the NHL, 21 years old, got a long ways to go. I don't even know where to start on this one. Like, this guy just had a dream come true. He played his first game and things in Calgary are an absolute struggle right now. And when they're like this, it probably is even tougher to play for Daryl Sutter. You know, last year they're running through the league. They're dominating everyone. It's probably easier right now. It's like, oh boy. And it's just so unnecessary. I I don't, I don't see the point. Uh, What number is he? And just read through his stat line, which wasn't anything great. Like, what what's wrong with yeah you know good effort by the kid he's got a happy long way to go him. yeah exactly a lot of work I, to do but very happy for him to get his first game pretty easy off the glass and out like yeah you end up like the kid the kid's like uh, all right <laughs> I mean I, I I and there's nobody that thinks that's that funny like players in the room don't think it's hilarious it's just. It's just no, kind I of unnecessary. It might be it might be running its course a little bit with the way that things are going this season. But back to your Oilers, uh, you know, I got to congratulate them six in a row, and they got one on a tee coming up on uh, the TNT broadcast this week against Columbus. So they should make it seven in a row. Um, they uh, they've been going with seven D lately. Yeah. Every single win in the last six wins in the, in this win streak, they've been playing seven D and. I think that Nurse's numbers as far as minutes are coming down a little bit, and it's served them well. Where sometimes when you're playing 28, 29 minutes, there's a few D men in the league who can handle that many minutes. But all of a sudden, you see some glaring mistakes come out where the, the game gets a little bit of sloppy. So I feel like he's definitely reeled things in and simplified his game with that. And with having six other guys, you know, it's like if you're, if you're making too many mistakes, they'll just go to the next guy. So maybe yep. it's smartened up the back end. Um, I'm not really crazy about the 70, 11 forwards because all of a sudden your your forward lines. I mean, I'm sure they love it if you're get they're getting uh, the fourth lines getting a couple reps with McDavid at center ice. Uh, I'm not sure how much that's happening, but I liked a little bit more consistency and and a guy where I knew what was going to happen. What's the term I'm looking for when you uh, when you're like you know something's going to happen? Hmm. My assurance. Brain, assurance. My, 
my brain is not really working today, guys. That's what happens when you spend uh, two days in Fort Lauderdale with, with Yand. Keith Yandel drinking a zillion fucking drinks. Um, predictable. I liked ah. playing with guys who were very predictable, where you knew exactly where the puck was going to go, a fourth line center, off the glass and out, off the glass and in, four check, stay in your fucking lanes. So it's, hey, it served Edmonton very well. They're playing you know, very, uh, very good hockey right now. And uh, as a, as an oiler hater, just because I'm on the Calgary side, it sucks to see. Yeah. McDavid, he got his 40th goal the other night. It's the fastest among active players. He got it done in his 48th game. Uh, Matthew said the previous record at 49. He's got 40 goals, 48 assists, 88 points in 48 games played. And he was also the quickest to 40 goals since 96 year when Yaga did it. So unbelievable what he's doing. That's crazy. Doing, it, That's, it is. It's the, almost the, like the, he had the, a the different best playmaker. Mindset. The best playmaker in the world just broke a record for f- fastest to to 40 goals in the last whatever, 20, uh, 32 years or whatever it is, 36 years. So it's like, you know, this all goes back to biz. Biz might be the reason this is happening. The question the is him off that much. The mindset coming into the season. The I think he's got time more, machine. More, more, sh- more shots so far than he did through like 60 games last year. So really? Of course it's, a, it's a, Of course it's a different mindset. I have noticed a lot of the goals lately. He's it's off the rush where uh, maybe before he tried it and he can beat so many defensemen and then cut it on the goalie. I've seen goals these past few weeks where he's just ripping at top of the circle and with how fast he's moving, changing that angle at all with how well he shoots the puck. It's like it's crazy. I've never seen the guy take a slap shot either. He's got a horseshoe up his ass too. 20, 20 percent shooting percentage right now. Okay. That's high. Very That's high. Tied. You think he could fizzle out come playoff time? No. You don't, no. yeah, you don't want to waste all the good ones now with dog. <laughs> no, no, that guy's a gamer. We saw him in the playoffs last year. I'm not worried. <laughs> They're not the only team out west that's heated up as well. Uh, Colorado's they've won five in a row after their two to one shootout win over um, Seattle the other night. That was an awesome game Saturday night. They've outscored the opposition 23 to six in those four games. They're now the second wild card spot at just the point behind Minnesota for third in the central. And that's going to lead to our next one. Now, Matt Dumba, he got scratched for the first time since 2016, was scratched two games in a row. Minnesota went 0-2 in those two games. And Mike Russo, the very excellent uh, beat writer for the Wild, he doesn't think it's a coincidence that the two games they scratched Dumba, the team loses. He thought it really had an effect on the team. People thought he was going to be getting traded, but it turned out to be about his play lately. So, Biz, have you guys ever been on, on a team where maybe a, a popular play gets scratched and then it sort of rattles the team? Do you buy, do you buy into the validity of that or what? Sometimes you could definitely throw the mojo off. I don't know like what's going on. On like pregame, if he's you know he's the guy getting the boys going beforehand. But uh, I think we've talked about it a couple times when his names came up on the trade blocks, where he'll go through windows of games and windows of times where he's he's kind of a river riverboat gambler, and where if the if that's not the their feng style shui, either, Biz. No, it's not. So if the feng shui is off, all of a sudden you could see games where you're like, holy shit, dude! Like, where, like, what planet's this guy on right now? But then when he is in rhythm, it looks unbelievable, and he's playing great hockey. So sometimes the fact that you're well liked will definitely keep you in the lineup, where the coach is very aware of that. But at a certain point, if the game is just not there, and they have enough guys who can fill in a piece and and you know be stable and and maybe not have as many mistakes where they're fucking ended up with high da- danger scoring chances on against. Yeah. Sometimes you got to teach a little lesson. You can get a couple good practice days in reset the mind and, or maybe they can look for a way to move them. I mean, that would be a nice chunk of change to be able to go spend on a piece that they think that they could fill in and help their team right now. I want to say he's making five, maybe five and change. I don't dislike Dumba either. I think he's an unbelievable guy and he has stretches of time where he's a great player. It's just, you know, sometimes he's a little bit inconsistent. I I, I feel like we, we've had this conversation on our podcast yeah. probably three times now, Whit. Well, he's been he's been rumored to be getting dealt for what seems like two to three years. So this was the first time they actually scratch him. What's interesting is you scratch a guy like that, you lose one. Usually he goes back in, but it was two in a row. I would be shocked if he's not in the next game they're playing. I believe it's Tuesday night. I don't know, Ari. You started it with asking, have you ever seen a player get scratched and the team ends up kind of being rattled and struggling? I got yes. scratched in Edmonton. The team started fucking winning. So <laughs> <laughs> go figure. Guys were celebrating, popping bottles of Dom when I got scratched finally. So I, I, I think it can affect the team in some ways. But once the game starts, it really doesn't because you're out there to do your job and win a game and you don't really give a fuck who's in the lineup. That's just a fact. I mean, you see guys leave with horrific injuries and the team's got to keep playing. That's just how it goes. So that's on them if they're letting something like that affect their team. But 
it, it's a guy who, when Biz said it perfect, when he's on, he's dominating. And when he's off, it's just the decision making with the puck that I that I think coaches can get a little frustrated with. But Minnesota ideally wants him in the lineup playing their best because they are a better team when he's going. Um, a quick answer to your first question, though, R.A. I mean, Yans went through it last year when he was on the Ironman streak and then Hazy this year. And I know that those guys were extremely well liked in the locker room. So I know the game that Hazy was scratched this year, they lost. I would imagine there were some poopy pants in the locker room that night. Hazy's heated up too. He's oh. he had the hat trick recently. Uh, yeah. He had two. He had two goals Sunday, uh, Saturday or Sunday night. So he's he's playing awesome. Very happy for his All Star. And quickly on Colorado, it 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 kind of all turned around. Remember they lost to the Blackhawks, and it was like, what the fuck's going on? And since then, boom. I think that's one of those things where it's like enough is enough. We just lost to a team blatantly trying to lose games. Like, what the fuck are we doing? And McKinnon's back. They're going. McCars missed a couple games, but things are turning around. There's no worries for Colorado in my eyes at all. What well, worked for New York Rangers when Truba chucked the helmet after they lost to the Chicago Blackhawks. Yeah. And then Blackhawks turned- get teams going. If you yeah, lose to them, huh? you're just an absolute loser. You gotta go. Yeah. Uh, as for Dumba, he's in uh, last year of a five-year, $30 million deal. He does have a modified no-trade clause. He can name 10 teams he don't want to go to. Uh, 28-year-old is in his 10th season, so I think that number is probably going to maybe be a deterrent to a lot of teams that possibly picking him up at a $6 million uh, cap. But, uh, I don't know. Russo also doesn't think his trade value is too high right now, but obviously we'll see what happens there. Meanwhile... And part uh, of it is that yeah. Garen's made it clear, like, I'm not giving you him for a draft pick. Like, I want, like, we're trying to win a Stanley yeah. Cup. So if you want him, you're giving us something that'll help us right now. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, we got to give a shout out to Bruins goalie Linus Olmark, uh, the prohibitive favorite to win the Vesna Trophy right now. He set a new NHL record for the fewest decisions needed to win 25 games. That way he had 28 decisions, won 25 of them. Uh, the prior record of 29 was held by Bruins legend Tiny Thompson with. Way back in the 1920s. Olmark, look at these numbers. 25-2-1, and 182 one, goals against, 938 save percentage, two shutouts. Stunning numbers for a guy in, in any time of the year. Uh, the Bees continue to haul ass as well, 37-5-4. and four. They're on pace to break the NHL record. I also want to say congrats to assistant equipment manager Matty Falconer. He worked his 1,000th game Sunday night versus San Jose. So always like to shut out those guys. What, yeah. what, do you got, what do you got in the bees for us, buddy? No, great guy. Maddie's an awesome dude. I used to see him a lot when I lived in the Navy Yard in Charlestown. And just an awesome dude. You saw how happy the guys were for him as well. And that's just an amazing accomplishment. We've said before, those guys keep everything running smoothly. So congrats to him. Uh, the Bruins Sunday night, just just an all-time gambling um what's the word dominant performance by yours truly i i had them you know they were like minus 380 to win the game uh in regulation minus 220 puck line was like minus 200 just no, no value so what does wit do takes him in the first period three way so if the first period ends in a tie i'm a loser Boom, crush that one. Second period, I took him three-way again. Crush that one. Second period, I also took a minus one and a half. They won that period two nothing. Hammered that. So I didn't even have to watch the third period. All my three bets were winners. McAvoy with one of the goals of the year by a defenseman, just an Beautiful Bobby Orr esque rush through center ice, walked a couple guys, scored a beauty. Lindholm with another one, just a dirty toe drag. Last guy back of the blue line, shelf down. The team is it's outstanding. It, it's just incredible to watch pasta. Um, so many different factors that have led to this success. All market Swayman being the biggest ones, I think, with just the goaltending forces they are. And and I, what is slowing this team down? What's going to slow them down is Toronto or Tampa in the second round. Even some of my buddies are like, oh, no, well, first round, you know, you're going to get Pittsburgh. You're going to get possibly the Islanders. You're going to get possibly Washington. It's like they're going to fucking smoke whoever's the, the eighth team. Even if it's Pittsburgh, they're going to smoke them. And then the second round, you get T.O. or Tampa, and that's when the real test starts. So if you're the Boston Bruins, you don't make a move at the deadline? Uh, you do what you can. Um, I've been I've been very clear with mortg- mortgaging anything you possibly can. Now, the problem is they don't have prospects. They don't have draft picks. I don't know what they're going to be able to do being up on the cap. But this is one of those examples of like, we're letting it all go. We have no idea what the future holds, and this is it. So no matter what we have to do, if it's possible, we're bringing in whoever we can. And I mean, I know we talk about them every podcast, but just like we talk about McDavid, what they're doing right now is... Yeah, you, you know, can't not. not. You can't not. They're about to shatter records. The, you, the, you, we're, we're putting them up towards the, the Tampa, the year they won the President's Trophy and got beat out in the first round. Um, I, was it the 90... 
What 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 year did Detroit just have an absolute juggernaut of a team? 96? 95, and then they lost 90, to the Devils. 95, 96? 94, 95. 94, 95. So it's one of those types of seasons, guys, and, and they haven't slowed down one bit, even to the point where I I would have took the Rangers a few nights ago when they beat them 3-0. Just at some point. Well, you're we were like, in Florida, and Biz and I were talking about getting some bets in, and we both agreed, like, ah, the Rangers are buzzing. Like, this could be one. It's like they just go in there and suffocate them in MSG. It's just it's a crazy, it's a crazy team right now. And and I guess people are laughing at me considering what Tampa did to to lose four straight to Columbus a few years back. I think it's a little different. I think there's guys there that have been there and done that. Um, and, and you're not going to see that happen in the first round of the Bruins. But that second round, no doubt they could lose to either one of those teams. Is I think you asked about trade deadline. I think depth defenseman is is the, probably their biggest need, like a Luke Shen, someone like that. Like a like a five or six. Yeah. Just, just in case of injuries down the line, their D always get hurt in the playoffs, especially okay. with Carlo. Oh, man, as a Bruins history. fan, I saw Carlo ended up fighting Timo Meyer um, after a little skirmish in the corner. It's like whew. Carlo is so solid. One of those defensemen when you don't say his name, it's a good thing because he's just so so easy to wa- like watch. Like in terms of a Rob Scuderi, he's just not making many mistakes. He's shutting guys down. But the concussion issues, you know, Neely and Sweeney were just kind of watching with holding their breath him fighting you're, you're not looking for that with a guy who's dealt with all that head stuff definitely not it's a parrot g with uh, biz i think yeah depth that's basically the bees all they can really deal for i mean unless they get someone to take some money off the books i i don't see why they would do that bringing depth forward depth defensive depth just you know get, get a little more uh, a little more a few guys in there because guys are definitely gonna get hurt in the playoffs but i wouldn't expect any splashy moves or any of these big names i mean i would shit my pants if they ever got horvat i just don't see where where that's gonna line up at all money wise uh but we're talking about the bruins so boys what do we say we send it to one of the bruins legends zdano chara right about now yeah this is do perfect it. and and i mentioned uh after we interviewed him after the winter classic like the the whole interview is great but i think the first half in terms of what this guy did coming up and how he became a pro it is incredible. I think everyone, um, hockey fan or not, will enjoy this interview. This interview is brought to you by Labatt. There's a little bit of Canadian kindness in every sip of Labatt Blue Light. How did it get in there? They're Canadian. That's how. You can spread the love yourself by sharing a Labatt. When you share a Labatt, you're not just sharing a beer. You're sharing an experience that'll pair with anything from hockey to a hoedown. Gee, do you have any Labatt Blue Light over the weekend or what? Yes, R.A., uh, the Labatt Blue Lights were flowing this weekend. Uh, my dad's, all my dad's buddies, uh, they all got together, obviously, with the circumstances this weekend. And they're, all their favorite beers is Labatt Blue Light. So we were definitely uh, pounding a few of those and, and, you know, talking about all the good times. Not, no better way to talk about the good times than a nice, over a, a nice Labatt Blue Light. Yep, I love getting it. My favorite pizza place in Boston has Labatt. Always going to grab a couple cold ones when I have my pizza. And the next time you're watching hockey with your buds, be sure to share a Labatt. Because while you might not all root for the same team, you can all enjoy a Labatt blue light. Labatt, the pristine Canadian pilsner. Share a Labatt. Let's bring it to Big Z right now. Thanks again to him and Matt Cater. I couldn't be much more excited to welcome our next guest to the show. A third round pick by the Islanders at the 96 draft, this player went on to become this century's premier shutdown defenseman in the NHL, playing 1,880 regular season and playoff games over 24 seasons with four clubs. He won a Norris Trophy and was a finalist five other times. He made the year-end All-Star teams seven times and played more games than any other defenseman in league history. And in addition to being the tallest player in NHL history, he was captain of the 2011 Stanley Cup champion, Boston Bruins. R.A. shaking, folks. <laughs> it's a real treat to welcome this future Hall of Famer to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Zdeno Chara. How's it going, Big Z? Good. Thank you so much for having me, guys. It's a pleasure, and uh, congrats on your uh, success with uh, everything you guys do. Okay, thank you. You didn't mention the, the greatest free agency signing in probably National Hockey League history, R.A. That's what you always say every pod that Z's mentioned. Yeah, I saved it for a little later. I figured we'd get to it later. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about <laughs> He's it. Like, you took my line, man. <laughs> so how, how's retired life treating you? Good, good. Uh, it's been obviously a little bit different, uh, a little change. Uh, I got to get used to uh, being kind of like home a lot and uh, um, spending a lot of time with my kids, uh, which is great. My boys start playing hockey, so spending a lot of time at their hockey rinks and uh, 
Yeah, it's been good. Uh, getting kind of like uh, new ideas, um, you know, it's adjustment, but uh, so far it's been so good. Uh, I'm curious because the legendary work ethic, have you started eating a little dessert yeah. occasionally? Are you still in the gym as much yeah. as you were before? Yeah, no, I I, I, I enjoy um, staying active, yeah. um, you know, in different ways. Obviously, I don't lift heavy as I, as I used to. But I, you know, I love, you know, going outside and go for runs and b riding bikes. And, so you and still run, even yeah. your height never? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's crazy. yeah, I ran this morning. <laughs> wow, so. imagine seeing this guy running. Yeah. Is, is it true you don't drink much or if at all? And the first time you had a sip of alcohol in years was when you guys won the Stanley Cup and it was, uh, yeah. it was red wine? Um, I don't know if that was red wine, but <laughs> yeah, I don't drink much. Uh, almost kind of none. Um, you know, it's uh, something that... Uh, um, you know, it happened in my family uh, in the past, and I tried to stay away from it. And uh, kind of, uh, you know, few, few kind of, uh, um, uh, I guess, life uh, uh, Special standards occasions. that uh, I, I try to stay away from. Do you get any new challenges going on? I know you like took a real estate course a few years ago. You like to like give yourself something, self something to do. You get, what do you have going on like that? Anything? Like yeah, I'm always uh, kind of open to to learn something and um, you know kind of experience new things. Um, so I sign up for a few courses um, just to you know expand knowledge. Um, just nothing for for degree or anything. I want to kind of uh, maybe use for the future, but just for myself, just to stay active and uh, keep my mind busy. What subjects? Uh, financial literacy and oh some God, of the stuff that uh, oh Professor I, don't, <laughs> I don't think I'm prepared for this interview. Yeah, <laughs> my mind yeah, in my pretzel seat. Yeah, and some of the stuff that uh, you know the Harvard Business School offers, uh, you know, uh, as a correspondent uh, online uh, courses. So, so you just been like always addicted to learning, just constantly. I wouldn't say addict, uh, addicted, but something that I'm willing to always kind of uh, expand knowledge about. You know, I I kind of don't like sitting at the meetings or sitting at you know interviewing or or having dialogues with people and, and all of a sudden you just don't have idea what they're talking about. Yeah. So I want to be at least in, in a picture and, and have some somewhat idea what they're talking about and and have conversations and, and expand basically knowledge because you never know what uh, could be in the future uh, for you to be, you know, uh, maybe working at or, or, you know, using it for, yeah. for, your, for your advantage. And, and then the, the, what do you speak? Seven languages I read? Well, it's kind of. Uh, I feel like it's almost every time somebody's mentioning the languages. It's not he said a eight at one point. They, they like, added eleven in three it's years. Like <laughs> adding right. So I grew up uh, basically with a Slovak and Czech language. My dad is Czech, my mom is Slovak. Then grew up uh, uh, under the communist regime. The Russian was mandatory in school. So right there, you know, you you kind of growing up with three languages. Then I went to the high school, and when the curtain went down. We were actually able to use different languages as a, as a subject. So I pick up on German and English. And then I played in 2004 in Sweden. Uh, in about four or five months, I was able to, you know, fluently no way. speaking in Swedish. So still now, if you want to. Well, yeah, it's kind of getting harder. I mean, yeah. if you don't you use it, you lose it. Kind of, yeah. I, I still understand quite a few, uh, yeah. you know, words and all those sentences. But but if you don't speak with it, you know, you kind of, you're, you're losing a little bit. So yeah. it's, it's getting well, harder. Was there even like, was there Rosetta Stone back then? Like, would you, would you listen to learn the language or is it just from just speaking to, to Just teammates? speaking, yeah. When I was in Sweden, I actually had uh, a tutor, was a friend of uh, my, fr you know, my, one of my best friends Radek Hammer who played here and uh, that was one of the reasons one of the reasons I, I signed with Feriestad because he was on the team and his one of his best buddies got hurt um, I think he torn his ACL and uh, skiing or something and he's like listen like if your friend wants to kind of like you know expand knowledge about you know Swedish culture and all that stuff so we started hanging out and you know he just started bringing me books and we started like kind of he started tutoring me basically and wow. by, the of, by the end of the season I, was, I told the coach like you don't need to speak English <laughs> I'm okay with Swedish and then he was like oh that's great and then we started speaking Swedish and that was that was it was great that's incredible wow. have you been watching the boys much this year I know you had a couple teams after the Bruins but were you local you've been uh, keeping tabs on Berge and Mashi and stuff yeah I I didn't uh, uh, I I came to see about three games four games um but not a whole lot i mean it's kind of late um you know coming home after the games and I'm, i like to get up early uh, in these days around 4 35 and uh you know go for run or bike ride and and then get my boys and my kids ready for school so 
um, you know, it would be tough to come home at 11.30 uh, after the games. And uh, But I went to about three, four games. So I'll buy watching them. It's just uh, it's incredible. They, they're just beating everybody. I think we should probably go back to the beginning. You were born in, in Trenchin, Slovakia. Is that how you say it? Trenchin? Yeah, Trenchin, yeah. What was your childhood like? And like, how did, like, was you, the work ethic that you have instilled in you by your family? Like, how, how did you, your father, I know, mm. I know I've heard stories about you training with him. And he was a wrestler, right? We're, we're going to get into this crazy regimen that you ended up having and, mm. and, and obviously growing into an NHL star. Uh, I don't know about the star, but. I was yeah, born super, and raised, star, um, born and raised in, in actually Czechoslovakia back then. Um, you know, we became our own country in 1993. But um, you know, we I, I had a great childhood. Um, you know, as a kid, we were always playing outside. Um, you know, we were a family of four. I have an older sister. My dad was uh, basically working. Um, you know, when I was young, he was still active. He was a Greco-Rome wrestler. And he pretty much take, took me to, to the gyms and all these uh, sports events. So I was always around kind of like athletes and, and sports environment. My mom was a hairstylist, her, her hairdresser. And uh, my, uh, my, uh, my uh, sister, she went to a school f to be a, a tailor. And um, yeah, we were you know living pretty humble lives and, and nothing special. You know, we, we play outside a lot. and uh, All different was, sports. All different sports, yeah. all, all the time. You know that was that was great about you know uh, back then that you know you went outside and in one hour you play soccer, next hour you play tennis, next hour uh, basketball and street hockey, and, and it was just so much fun. And I think that uh, that's something that in these days you don't you don't see much. You know. So, so your intro into hockey, I'm guessing your father never played. My father never played, and uh, you know he kind of got me into. Uh, at early age into wrestling, the basics of the wrestling. And, um, you know, I think that gave me very good foundation on uh, agility, abilities, conditioning, um, you know, a little bit of gymnastics and you know, flexibilities. And then one day he came home and um, he asked me, hey, you, you know, you want to try playing hockey? How old are you at this point? I was, uh, I started late. I think I was around seven, eight. Okay. So he said, you know, there there is some, you know, recruiting of of, of youth youth uh, kids, you know, for 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 hockey, and which he didn't tell me that that my kind of uh, age group was already playing for probably a year or so. Yeah. So when I came on the ice, I was basically just going along the boards and just try to learn how to skate. And guys are flying around. And my, my basically age group was just flying around with the pucks and, and skating and shooting. And I'm like, oh, I'm way behind. So at first it was very, you know, um, you know, tough to kind of blend in. You know, you're always behind, you're always kind of struggling. And, and uh, you know, kids were probably making fun of me. And uh, but my dad said, hey, just, uh, you know, keep working. Um, working at it and, and we're going to be working off uh, of the ice a lot and and so you can catch up on that, uh, other things and and eventually you know it will it will happen and uh, you know so that's what we did during that because granted seven years old you're seeing these kids fly around but you still loved it like were you ever like i don't want to do this anymore no no no, no. I, I fell in love with it yeah and i remember very first time he brought me to the ring because our neighbor was uh, um working as a like the ice crew preparation um, team and and he opened up the ring one night um i remember it was night because it was dark it was only one light kind of like a spotlight uh, in the corner he turned it on and right before that kind of like the first day i step on the ice like yeah, put the skates on go try it I step on the ice, I fell down face first, <laughs> knocked my two, two teeth out. That was oh. my first experience. Oh, God. So my dad didn't have a helmet with a, with a cage. It was just a, like like just a helmet without a cage. So, Go ahead, bud. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I went down, knocked my two teeth out, uh, you know, and, and that was my first touch with the ice. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is, a, this is like... <laughs> This, this is, is awesome. Like, most most like, kids ah, would have quit. Yeah. Said, Fuck this. Us. Give me so, the basketball, Dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was uh, that was. But I, I just, uh, I remember the smell of that hockey ring. You know that 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 smell of the ice. It's just a different kind of uh, environment. I went home and and I said, you know, I, I'll, I just love it. I just love to be kind of in that environment with the kids and playing, um, you know, on a team. And uh, so that was that was something that 
you know. Because your father didn't have the hockey background, like who did you lean on to, to continue to develop your skills? Were there were there pro players around that, that had hockey camps there? Were there, was there anywhere anyone from there that like was off to the NHL and would mm-hmm. come back in the in the summer that you would look up to? Um, well, my my dad was kind of like a, my main uh, coach. I would say, uh, not officially, but he was obviously uh, trying to guide me to to work and, and keep working and, and doing the extra stuff. But I was lucky because Trenchin was a very strong base of a, a hockey hockey team. The reason for that, because uh, there were, at the time when I said Czechoslovakia, there were two army-based uh, um, teams and what I mean by that was Dukla Jihlava, which was in Czech Republic, and Dukla, Dukla Trenčín in Slovakia. So whoever was eligible to serve the army or military service, and while he was playing, he was able to play and serve at the same time um, in this uh, in these two teams. Okay. So Slovak Slovak uh, good players went to Dukla Jihlava. Czech uh, players uh, went to uh, Slovakia. So it was kind of like exchange. In international well, events, they'd almost combine the best players. But at that both. time, it was one country. Yeah. So so basically, they were basically serving the the service, which was mandatory at that time, was two years. Well, it was easier uh, service because they were playing hockey. Yep. But they were like gathering the best players on both sides and playing. So we, we, we had that, you know, privilege to watch these best players, you know, playing in the, in the, in the extra league, uh, you know, every other night. And you're going uh, to the games. And you're going a, oh, to the games as a, as a kid. So you, you were inspired, you were motivated to play. You know, we we saw, you know, you know future NHL players uh, uh, playing right in front of us, like Ruzicka, you know, and, and all these uh, players who, who made it eventually to the uh, NHL, Svehla and those guys. You actually played center very early in, before your career as a kid, right? Did you get to learn some skills playing center? Yeah, I started as a forward. Uh, then I being moved to play uh, defense. And then, um, you know, at age uh, 13, 14, I've been cut by, by junior teams and coaches. And and that's when I, I played for junior B teams and, and in B leagues. And that's when we didn't have enough uh, players and at that point the coach you know said hey you know we need to have somebody playing for us so i would play forward and i would play the one shift i would play forward center or whatever and then i would play the uh, next shift and because we would have 12 kids how were you as a center probably good i was you. actually, <laughs> actually i loved it imagine this guy as a forward the nhl just clobbering guys on the yeah, four check yeah no i loved it i was um i was very motivated believe it or not um you know despite all the cuts all the you know challenges and uh, adversities i faced i i have to say those days were one of the most memorable days i had with those teammates with those guys because that was the end of it right that was the last chance we had we were cut we were just you know nobody wanted us and we played for each other we, yeah. we had so much fun we had such a you know camaraderie such a strong bond and till Today we stay in touch. We kind of like sometimes see each other, where we text each other, and we just you know like you know it's 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 a great feeling when from basically that type of a environment or group, you still have such a strong bond. And uh, yeah, I play with the uh, guys who were like <laughs> you know much smaller, but I was trying to protect them. So it was it was it was great. It was great learning too. Was this a point where? You're already getting up at 4.35 a.m. You're working out before school. Like, was your dad into that? Like, were you already really starting this training early, as early as then? Uh, not as early. Uh, and the reason for that, because the practices, which we had as a junior B teams or B leagues, were very late. So at that point, when I was cut and I was, I had to play for different uh, teams, which were away from trenching. And I had to commute. I had to take trains. I had to take buses. So I had to go and, and I would play, you know, uh, one year in Piestani, which is uh, about 40. Isn't know. that the capital? No, no, no. It's oh, not. Uh, Brat- oh, yeah. oh, no, it's Bratislava. <laughs> Bratislava. <laughs> See, I know my shit with. Yeah, yeah. No, Piestani is about, uh, I would say, 45 kilometers from Trenčín. And uh, that was one year I played there. The next year, ne- next year I played in Dubnica, which is uh, closer. But I, I was just basically commuting by, by trains or, or buses and... You know, when you're on the B squad, you are having practices after eight squads. So, yeah. you know, there was like, hey, you know, there's some, you know, 9.30, 10 p.m. 
you know, open eyes, okay, let's give it to the B squad. And that's what we did. We just skated it so late. So by the time the practice was over, You're I'm, taking, I'm taking a train and coming home at 11.30 midnight. Jesus and Christ. I had to get up at 6 for 7 o'clock school or 7.05 sometimes, you know. So it was like... It was tough, but the, you the, loved it. You, you didn't, you, and it wasn't even. I, was it even about making the A squad, or you like you had those goals, or are you just loving the game so much? You're just enjoying every day, in a sense. I didn't love it, but I didn't want to give up. I mean, it's a it's a kind of a, a balance that, despite all the you know, like I said, challenges or people telling me you know you should give up, you should quit, you should play basketball, and you are not good enough, and this and that. I just hated to satisfy them or please them by saying, okay, I, I had enough. I just kept kind of like believing it and I, I stick with it. And uh, what was very good that that I had very few people who said, you know, stay with it. Like, don't listen to them. You know, it just gives you that little hope. It gives you that little, you know, a match that, that you kind of like burn later on. But I was just like so committed to like prove them wrong. Yeah that I said, I'm not going to give up. And eventually it, it just, you know, it happened. That, so you're that, telling me when you're playing there in, for the B team, there's no doubt in your mind that you're going to find a way to get to the NHL. No, no. I mean, I, I just had at that point, you NHL, that's like, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was not even like in a picture. I mean, that was like, for me personally, it was just like, I'm not going to give up. Like I didn't know what was ahead of me. So you didn't was, know the goal, what the, uh, the end goal was. Yeah, I mean, you, my vision was was or or the goal setting was was short. Like it was like, hey, yeah. stick with it, keep working, uh, finish the season, and and be a, be a, as as good as you can, and, and keep working, keep 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 trying. You'll know, never give up. And then, you know, all of a sudden, like I got a break, and the break came when we had a game, our B squad. We had a game right after the A squad team, Dukla, and we played in Trenching. So all the scouts who came to see the A squad um, went to the you know buffet uh, or the restaurant, the the, the ring restaurant and, and cafeteria, whatever you want to call it. And while they were having whatever meal or or coffee, and they were making the notes about the players, we came on the ice for warm up. They're forced to watch it, and sense. then all of a sudden they're like, "Wait a minute! Like there is this kid like." He can skate, he's big, he's this. And then like, who is this? Why is he in B squad? So all of a sudden, like that word somehow must have spread out, right? And now the coach from B squad is telling me, look, like I'm having scouts, NHL scouts asking about you. All of a sudden, my my attitude, my my hope, my, my you know, it was, I was so encouraged. I was so happy. I was That's so awesome. motivated. Like all of a sudden, like what? Like, okay. It's working. Like I, it's, it's something, right? Like there is a hope. There is a hope. There is something, right? Like, so I, I kind of like, you know, I got it, you know, it was a little bit of, of that, that reward in a, in a, in a, in a distance. But I, I was like, listen, just, just keep going at it. And then it was pretty regular now that that my my dad even was telling me like, hey, we're getting phone calls from these people, scouts in Europe, coming and asking me when you're gonna play the game and they wanna come and watch you. And so now it's on, right? Yeah. Like I'm like I'm in the basement. I, I was always working on, but I'm like now I'm going twice as hard, you know, twice as long, and I'm just like I'm extra motivated and. Uh, eventually came to the point where we took the registration hockey uh, license uh, as a player and uh, I got uh, transferred or we, we took the, you know, the, 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 the registration and we went to Sparta Prague and I was able to practice with the men's team and play for the uh, uh, Sparta Prague Junior A team. Which is like another level from. Yeah. Did that mean moving, like, and like living yeah. there? Yeah. I I moved. I was living in in Prague. Did your parents go, or was it just you? No, just, just me. And? I was staying in like a one a, one room, one bedroom apartment. Um, was like a <laughs> size of this basically hotel room, <laughs> on my own, no car. Seven, seventeen years old. I or? was seventeen, eighteen years old. Yeah. Yeah, went to Czech Republic and just, uh, yeah, that was it. I just finished the, basically high school. I graduated from high school and ran, went right to the um, Prague. And when you're talking off ice, you're in the basement. Was it always lifting, working out, or were you just a can, or were you shooting pucks? Was it, or was it more just like for your body? Everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 
I was able to, uh, under the guidance of my dad, um, you know, develop pretty basic regime, workout regime. It was like, you know, Monday, upper body, uh, Tuesday, you know, shooting, uh, Wednesday, legs, you know, so whatever it was. But I always like had three, three time, three times a day uh, working out. So it was just basically running, biking, you know, skipping, uh, shooting pucks. It was just a... So we we created different drills, different tools, yeah. and uh, it was constantly uh, uh, you know working, working, working. Was it in Prague where where you were maybe were you, I don't know if you were drafted to the WHL, but how were you discovered to come over to, to yeah. North America? Yeah, that's a great question. So once I was in Prague, it was kind of like I said, it was already out there that there's you know a lengthy kid with potential. That was it. You were like William Wallace. That you were this like, that, that was it. You know, there's those cell phones back yeah, then. So nothing. it's just like, there's I mean, this guy, he's fucking 6'11, 7'1, 7'8. Lightning bolts out of his yeah, arse. Yeah, yeah, 50 yeah. men. Yeah. 50. But yeah, I mean, that's so 50 It men. was like you were a project, but there was so much potential they saw. He toe dragged 50 so. men. <laughs> uh, I guess so. But no, in Prague, directly in Prague was a scout uh, name of Karl Pavlik, um, who. Um, basically recorded on VH, uh, VHS tapes. I remember those. So he kind of recorded uh, me skating, practicing, uh, me lifting in the gym, and he sent those tapes to, obviously, the Islanders. And uh, Mike saw them, and uh, Chris Pry was the uh, director of player development. And uh, based on that tape, I got drafted. No way. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Nobody saw me really from... I was under the radar, like... At that time, uh, the um, uh, Yuri, Yuri Hanish was the uh, uh, agent who, repre- who was working with uh, uh, another agent here. And uh, they brought me to the draft. And basically they said, like, look, like, we believe if we take you to the draft and you go through the interviews and they see you, it will, it will bring you up even more and, and somebody's going to take a chance. And sure enough, that's that's what happened. It was totally unexpected, and I was so grateful and and honored. And it was a, such a privilege to be drafted. Like I imagine that twelve months prior to that, I was playing on junior B team, B squad with twelve <laughs> guys with no sticks. <laughs> Uh, Barely broken, can get the skate sharpened. And outside the ring with no glass and just the nets behind the net. Like, it was just crazy. Like, it was, I, I uh, <laughs> thinking back now, I was like, what, what, what happened? Like, it's just, uh, yeah. I have so many, like, different questions I want to ask from here. So, so, Mike Milbury saw these videos. Now, do you still have these VHS tapes? I'm sure there are somewhere. Oh yeah. man, I would love to yeah. see you just yeah. chucking weights as, as a young guy on these. No, VHS. it was it was a, yeah. I I remember because um, when I showed up at the uh, the men's team in Prague and we went to the gym, I was pretty much outlifting the men because I was just so much. I was used to just lifting and, yeah. and being so strong. So. Always, so these guys were like, "This kid must be on steroids." Like, what is he doing? Like, this is eighteen-year-old kid and lifting this much. And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm on steroids, whatever." And uh, so, Test him. so yeah. And these days, Mike saw it, and he told me later on that he didn't really want to take me in the fifty-six overall. But the scouts, the Swedish scouts, convinced him. It's like, you got to take him because if you don't take him. I think Phoenix was next or somebody was like, yeah, they wanted God to damn it. They said like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to take him for sure. They had some word, you know, it was my, probably not a Swedish guy working for Phoenix. Like we're going to take him for sure. Like, so they convinced Mike and Mike said like, okay, but he never saw me live. He never basically just saw it, with, you know, VHS tape. So were you drafted to the NHL before you were either drafted or invited to go play in the WHL? Yes. So it was the Islanders that probably set that up or so yeah, I got drafted. They wanted you to come over. I'm guessing. So I was already over. I was in uh, I was in St. Louis, um, and then we got a call from uh, WHL um, because they because I told my agent like I I want to stay here. I I don't want to go back. I didn't tell my parents too. I went to the draft. I had a small bag, one pair of jeans. Like I'm staying here. And I said I decided right there and then that I'm staying. I don't want to go back because number of reasons. Mainly because if I go back, uh, I'm going to end up, I have to go serve uh, at that time, 18, 18 months, uh, uh, the mandatory military service. And I didn't have guarantee I'm going to play for Duke Trenching because I already left, right? I took my reg- registration card 
and I went, you know, to Czech Republic. So now they will be probably upset that I left. Yeah. I would be maybe ending up in different spot that that some base that didn't allow to play hockey while you served it. So eighteen months would go be I'll be I'll be done. Like yeah. you know and at that time I think that um to ask uh New York Islanders organization to pay whatever the uh, the bounty, whatever the the fee, whatever they need for for me to 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 get me out of it would be almost impossible, right? They wouldn't be willing to pay it at that time. So I, yeah, of course. And then so I decided to stay. Of course, you know, a few weeks later, uh, my dad's phone like, "Hey, there is like military service looking for you. Oh, like you, oh, deserted, shit. you deserted the yeah the uh, uh, you know the service the 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 country uh, obligation. I was like, I know, but this is important. So I couldn't go back home for two years. I stayed. I stayed. You know. So going back, I got drafted. Got a call from uh, WHL uh, and um, Dennis Polonich. You might guys know him. He was a GM at that time for Prince George Cougars, and he's like, we have a you know I think it was like third pick or second pick, whatever. He's like, we want to know if we you know pick you if you gonna come to yeah. pg i'm like yeah of course he's like are you sure because you know i don't know if you know where pg is i'm like i don't care <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I said, I, that's I, probably I, the best case scenario. I, I have been i always heard it's in the middle of nowhere yeah, right yeah. For sure. and i had no idea where it was and i didn't care yep. because i just wanted to stay i wanted to have a chance and you know learn the culture learn the hockey style learn the language better um so i said yeah for sure i'm gonna stay you know, okay, so that's what happened. They they chose me. They picked me for um, you know, and I went to uh, stay the summer in Edmonton. Had a beautiful Billets family, uh, Jonathan Aiken family, uh, who was with high Bruins, pick with the Bruins, Bruins right? in nineteen ninety six first round. So I stay with them. Um, it was a is a great setup. Uh, worked out at the um, Edmonton University with Pete Friesen at that time who ended up actually, he was working with the Carolina Hurricanes for a long time as a strength and conditioning coach. And then before the season, went to Prince George and uh, played the season in Prince George. How was your English at this point? So, uh, yeah, uh, it was kind of like... Must uh, have been weird, hard moving over It was hard because back in home, uh, we were uh, being taught uh, the English English, right? It's not the North American kind of a slang, you know, getting used to the... The, you're talking like a Brit. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you come over here, you're like, I can understand anything. I'm like, well, this is kind of going to take some time. And, you know, it took probably two months, three months by the time I got kind of like hold of it. Yeah. Um, so you at that point, you'd never had a, f- a fight on the ice, correct? No, I had fights. Oh, you did? No, no, no. Oh, hey, he's fights. protecting the guys in junior yeah. B. Okay. Yeah. So the, the only difference, <laughs> which is big difference, back in junior B, we had cages, right? So you kind of fighting with the gloves on. Oh, and, okay. And, and you're punching guys in the head, but it's like, you know, with the cages on. But I had a number of fights and I was actually, you know, obviously boxing and doing Greg Rome wrestling as a, as a part of my workouts, but not the real, real fights when you actually drop the helmets like in, we did in juniors back then and go like fist fights. So that was the first time I've been challenged in, 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 you know, to the fights in, in juniors. That first year in PG, had you learned more in that one year than you'd had maybe in, in all your years of playing just based on like the talent pool? Uh, I believe Stan Butler was yeah, your first yeah, coach over yeah. here too. Yeah. Did he have no sideburns back then too? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This guy had the worst haircut. I love Stan, but oh my God. Uh, his sideburns came up to basically his forehead. No, he did a g- great job with me. I think the whole, uh, you know, I think him and Dennis Polange, like I said, they did a great job to kind of like changing the the team and, and how we were playing because till that point, Prince George was always out of the playoffs, uh, you know, losing records. And uh, when they both came in, you know, they changed it up. It was, it was we started to play better. We actually... Um, end up making the playoffs and uh, upset like f- top three teams, I believe. So we went almost to the Memorial Cup. We were like maybe one series away from being in the Memorial Cup. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was very much humbling and very learning experience because the bus rides, right? Like I, yeah. uh, oh, man. the first time I, I, I sat on the bus and they said, you know, we got to go to Kelowna. I'm like, okay, Kelowna. five, five hours in six, seven. I'm like, like where are, where we, are guys? we going? <laughs> and that was the shortest, that was the shortest trip. Seven oh, hours dude. to Kelowna, oh. seven and a half, eight hours of scum loops. 
And then, you know, next ones were like Spokane port 17 hours on the bus. So that was very humbling for me to go through this. And uh, as a first year guy, you don't get the bunk. You're just sitting yeah, there. You're I'm just like, sitting there. I'm you're six there. nine. I'm your, like, hip fla- <laughs> your hip flexors are just tall. You can't I, even play. I'm like suffering there on that you know third row seat um doubling up with somebody else and uh, it's just uh but you know i no complaining i i didn't complain i was happy i was i was on a team i was making progress um were you and, playing a big and, role then we playing 20 minutes or i don't know the yeah. times uh the stats but regular shift yeah you know I, I i play power play i play pk i played um obviously five on five all that stuff and uh yeah, I was. Uh, I think I was probably around. Yeah, around that. But uh, I I, uh, I saw a story this morning when I was reading up on you that uh, you ended up staying in PG after your first season yeah. there, and then you worked as a car washer. Yeah, and the, the guy from the cars car wash said it was awesome because he was so tall he could wash the roof with <laughs> ease. He'd be washing them in no time. Yeah, no. I like I said after the season, I um, I couldn't go back home. I knew I was like, okay, I, I can't go back home. I'm gonna get arrested. Um, so I, I talked to the billets, uh, Barb and Irv, man, beautiful family, and beautiful children. And, uh, you know, with the help of uh, Dennis, Stan, we found a dealership. They were willing to kind of pay me under the table. Uh, I was like a few hundred bucks a week. And then I found another job. So I had two jobs, uh, landscaping. So uh, basically during, you know, from I think it was like seven to 12 or seven to one was like a dealership washing cars. Made a deal with them that I could go to uh, a gym for two hours uh, from one till three I was in the gym. I remember I was eating like lunch in a car in this van, like <laughs> eating before I went to the gym, just work out. <laughs> then after I came back, dropped the car, got picked up and uh, it was another kind of a crew that were were kind of just letting me know, okay, we have a job, we have to plant the trees, we have to dig holes, we have to cut the lawn. So I went with them whenever they needed. So I had like kind of a two jobs and I would ride a bike, commute to the dealership. It was probably, you know, probably less than 10 miles. So each way. So every, every day I probably <laughs> rode, you know, close to 20 miles on the bike, went to the gym and then, you know, on we, you know, after or before I did some workouts. So I was constantly working out, work, uh, you know, working in the, in the two jobs and just giving the money to the family. I Jesus, just felt, man, I felt like, incredible. yeah, cause you're, you're staying with them. I'm staying with them. I'm eating, I'm eating like, <laughs> uh, you know, like <laughs> nonstop. They're we like, Oh, we took out a second mortgage yeah. cause yeah. of how much chicken breast yeah. you've been dumb. Yeah. <laughs> no, but they were so nice. The, I mean, we, we stay in touch till today. They, they came to see, for past 25 years they came to see z this uh, is remarkable buddy this uh, is uh, what, were you, what so you weren't skating story. right in the summer then no Time. ice no ice were you skating? no ice no ice just uh i mean and I then it wasn't calm. yeah no i i um i went for swims i went for work you know runs bikes but no no skating i mean pg has you know i don't know if anything changes now but they had only one one ring so when we were down obviously yeah we ice is up. Ice. I, I mean we haven't even touched the nhl yet but it's so good i think for, for all the kids listening like the work yeah. ethic and like what you had to do uh and, and endure in order to get to the how bad you wanted the, it. the nhl so i think we should th- hang it over our a here you, you want to start with that well actually uh your pre-draft interview with mike milberry he asked can you fight do you remember what your answer was back to him <laughs> I, I don't i, I think don't you took your shirt off and challenged it, you want to go said, mike that's why i drafted <laughs> you you said better not to fuck with me <laughs> and you want him over with that yeah oh, okay no 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 um now i remember See, now I remember. I said, better not piss me off, I think. Okay. <laughs> See, that's yeah. the Boston yeah, 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 translation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Blame the athletic. Yeah. I think I remember. Yeah, now I remember. See, but was it Mike? Yeah, could be Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he's he's notorious for his uh, his interviews with draft picks. We had Terry Ryan who came on. Uh, very different uh, type of story. We don't need to get into it. A little bit. Yeah. Now, so at Prince George, like just told Biz, you fought before. Was you getting challenged a lot by guys because you were a bigger guy? You know, your skating hadn't been fully refined yet. Were guys coming yeah. at you frequently? Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, you know, I think that first, you know, whatever five to ten games, I must have have a fight pretty much in every game. Um, you know, I I remember that there was a. I guess the the standard that I had to set that, you know, Ronald, because Ronald Petrovicki was on that team and he said, look, like they're going to challenge they, you. You're going to get challenged. There's going to be guys like Rob Skurlak, Scott Parker, you know, it would be, it would be coming. They, Toughest you know, so, of the tough. They, yeah. So 
I was like, all right, like I, I knew that I'll be challenged and I knew that for me to, again, make a progress, I got to answer the bell and I got to, I got to show them that I'm not going to be pushed around and I'm going to be standing up, sticking up for myself and my teammates. And so, yeah, first, whatever, um, yeah, I must have fights in every game. Yeah. Were you fearful? Like, did you like, you know, it was coming, like, let's say pregame nap, were you like, oh, no, no, I, I didn't know. And that was probably a good thing. I, I, I didn't know these guys. I was like, okay, well, somebody, <laughs> I, oh, okay. So <laughs> whoever it is, whatever, yeah, I, I was like, so, but then, you know, obviously like, as you go through the first rounds of fights and you know through the league then you go okay so these guys obviously much bigger strong and these guys you know different type of fighters so you kind of like prepare mentally for that type of a game but i remember my first fight i didn't even have my arms up you know ronald is screaming at me from the bench <laughs> put your arms up put your arms up i'm kind of like going to the fight and i'm like swinging my arms like uh, conor mcgregor i'm going towards the guy he's like <laughs> so like he's pink. like you got it i mean i did well in that fight i i you know i i believe i won the fight but but then he's like listen you gotta put your arms up like you gotta actually set you know so then he was actually then the next one they're over your head yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, no it's so, front of you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember that so it's kind of like these little things um um, yeah that's amazing did they, uh, many of them come back for seconds or did they learn their lesson the first time no it was it was i i have so much respect for for the guys i fought um regardless where um you know it was it was it was tough league you know the dub was very very tough um i believe at that time you know probably toughest league uh, oh, from the sure. q's and o's oh uh, you know it was it was definitely w had probably every team had two three guys yeah. that that could fight like heavyweights who end up being actually at some point in the NHL as enforcers. When you ended up, you know, becoming like the Norris Trophy All-Star, say you were 240, 245, at that point, were you still much lighter? Like, when did you become the size you are now in terms of the overall build? So I was very careful adding my weight just because I knew that I didn't want to slow down. I didn't want to wait cost me being... Um, or the weight being an issue of 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 kind of causing me more uh, bad than good. So I was. I remember I I, I was in P Prince George. I was uh, two thirty seven, and then I remember in New York I was about two forty seven. So in span of maybe a year and a half, I gained ten pounds, which is not bad, right? And then slowly, you know, two fifty. I think the heaviest I ever been was 263. Oh, you were that yeah. big. Oh, yeah. I didn't know you ended up getting that heavy. Um, yeah. What was the transition like to pro, like first camp, like all, all that, right? Because you didn't really spend much time in the minors. You you, you were up in, in, in uh, with the Islanders pretty, pretty yeah. quick. Yeah, so um, after that year with Prince George, that summer I signed the entry-level contract with the Islanders. So I got invited to the camp in September. It was like, yeah, I was like that was that was quite the biggest shock i guess for for someone who who didn't know what to expect at that at that time as you guys remember you could probably invite unlimited number of players yeah and we had four teams four full teams oh, mike man. had four full teams uh team a b c d we we had practice then you play scrimmage with next team and then you had another practice and a, and and workout yeah there was no time limit there was no, it was no three hour rule back yeah. then <laughs> and i was like after three four days i was like this is this is hard this is not easy like you know this is the nhl this is like man I'm, but i remember like in this uh you know uh, these games uh in, in a squad games like there were fights left and right no like it was like non-stop i mean we had mick vokoda kenny belanger steve webb there were guys everywhere and there was like fighting it was like wow like <laughs> <laughs> crazy crazy like think about it what it was like then and and what it's now i mean uh to appreciate it and and how much you have to like um what, what you had to go through to earn it uh, it's it's uh, it's a humbling to really think, think what was back. this like 97 or was this 90, 96 90, 96 yeah, did you have any thoughts of making the team out of that first camp no yeah, not he, at all not yeah. at all i was i was completely fine I, i've been uh uh sent to uh Kentucky. Uh, so back then it was AHL and IHL. I guess probably remember. 
And so IHL uh, was obviously the west west side, AHL was east side, and I was in Kentucky, and it was a great uh, great experience as well. Uh, but to your point, I'm thinking, okay, full year, I'm gonna stay here. Uh, November, I got called up. Is so that quick? Yeah, November. Um, you know, a few injuries. Uh, I think Richie Pilon got hurt. You know, somebody else got hurt up front, more like a you know, physical uh, uh, type of player. And, um, you know, I got called up and uh, me and Steve Webb, I believe we got called up. Jason Stradwick got called up as well. I think three of us got called up. I ended up playing my first NHL game on November 19th. The, uh, the, the one thing that stood out when I was like looking at the hockey DB, I think you were there for four seasons. You ended up having five head coaches. Was that weird seeing all that turnover and, yeah. and the chaos with that Islanders organization? Yeah, yeah, it was it was uh, it was almost disturbing. It was uh, every season and the whole coaching staff got fired. New coaching staff came in. <laughs> um, I think the the probably the best um word would be a uh, lack of patience i guess but that yeah. was also the, with the with the players too like you saw so many you know players coming in so, so many players leaving traded at one point i remember we were that, that might, might have been my third year we got probably 12 players dealt we were in vancouver and we just you know guys even didn't get a phone call they start reading their name in those bottom lines on the, on whatever the TSN, whatever. They were like, all right, I got traded, you know, Pocky's back. Right? The next guy I seen it, oh, I got traded. You know, like it was like, I believe we had, we didn't have enough, almost didn't have enough guys to, to play the game in Vancouver. We were in Vancouver and then, so yeah, it was, uh, it was one of those things that um, I guess, I guess also uh, some sort of experience, I guess, you know, going through that, it just uh, makes makes you realize that that it's a business as well, and it's a it's a hard business. If you don't perform, if you don't do well, it's kind of next. And eventually, it was it was your name on on the bottom of the headline there. Yeah. In, in no, RA, I'm, yeah. I'm sure you can list Summer. off the trade. It was it was a it was a was that the draft, deal. right? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, Z and the our first overall pick that turned out to be Spezza and Bill McCall, Alexi Yashin. So. Yeah. Uh, best free agent signs ever and probably one of the biggest ripoff trades ever will well, ever get taken to the cleanest but when you mentioned that before when you're training you know prince george in the summer there was no skating but at some point your skating be became so good was there a summer that you were on the ice a lot or was it more just as you grew into your body you finally were able to skate the way i think a little bit of both yeah um i was uh, able to start skating on a, a treadmills uh i remember there were the, there was like a first treadmill skating treadmill in edmonton and uh, at the same time, your body start to yeah. filling up, right? Like, I believe till you know, 17, 16, 17, you're still growing. You know, you're still kind of like, you're still being a teenager, really. I mean, for, I guess for some, uh, some kids, it comes sooner, for some, maybe a little bit later. And I guess because of the length and the size of mine, it just came later because it just takes time to fill up that body, right? If you six two, six three, you probably gonna be, you know, almost like a man uh, quite sooner. Yeah. If you, if you do the same regime workouts and nutrition, all that stuff. But for me, it just took longer. So I was maybe like a late boomer. But yeah, eventually, just uh, kind of and having like good skates and all that stuff, yeah. right? Like that that helped that was that was for me that was something i appreciate so much to be able to just you know having you know a new stick like i, I was in junior b school we didn't have enough sticks we played with broken <laughs> sticks we had tape ups and they sticks. must have been too short for you so too short and long and it was like you were not allowed to we had some we had maybe like two three practices a week but nobody shot a slap shot because can't you break have, a stick. You can't break a stick, right? <laughs> so when you were on the A squats, and back then because of the regime, mo like a lot of a lot of these clubs were sponsored or financed by by government. So you know, you know, the stakes were no issues. The gear you always kind of hand out the gear from older uh, uh, teams to the younger. You know, like. But on, when you're on the B, like nobody cares about B squats, right? So yep. it's like we were getting those used sticks, used gear that nobody wanted, and that's what we play. So for me to all of a sudden like go to you know WHL or Kentucky and now have 
unlimited you, he was like this is a dream come true you know, it was awesome yeah. uh, among all those coaches on long island one of them was was mike milbury what was it like having him for a coach how was your relationship with him i had a good uh, relationship with mike uh, obviously he's very intense um he wanted to win um he's emotional um but you know i think that um you know he he meant well he 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 wanted to win um but it just uh probably didn't work out you know uh, as well as he wanted to and and you know he ended up being obviously a manager and then he was hiring a coaches and he was trying to find a obviously the fit that would be quick fix as you want to call it right like win now right now we need it but that takes time i guess right so especially with the young group we had we had I don't know how many years in a row we had first round picks, right? Eric Bru, Roberto Luongo, we had uh, uh, Payet, I believe. Uh, Taylor J- Payet. J- T- T- Taylor Payet, yeah. JP Dumont. We had, you know, and, and then we were, there were some young players, Barrard, McCabe, uh, you know, we had, we had so yeah. many actually, you know, good players, young, at very young age, but it just takes time probably for them to um, mature. Yeah, I guess if you might call it and be be you know kind of in their you know effective year yeah. way, and then being but impatient was, just kind of ended up root being the I, demise of them. I guess that's what I kind of think. It was kind of like yeah, let's let's move on, let's trade this guy, let's try a new fade. We want to have a goal scorer. Let's get Yashin. You know, like yeah. And all of a sudden, boom! It's it's uh, summer of '01 when when that trade went down. Did you have any idea? Had you been hearing things? Like, or was it just like, holy shit, I'm, I'm traded? No, no, I've been, you know, we had the exit meetings and, you know, it was, it was one of those, hey, you know, you know, we're going to build this team around, you know, a few of you guys, you know, young guys, we're going to, you know, uh, try to kind of build this franchise. And so I'm kind of going home in the summer, like, okay, I'm uh, getting ready, you know, yeah. the, the, the normal way as I would always. Um, and then remember being in a on a cottage uh with my friends and uh and then um next day i came home and my dad hey there have been like a lot of phone calls from from <laughs> whatever and i don't understand english and so and then i found out that I, i've been traded uh, and probably the best thing for you i mean that's where you you started advancing like what like what allowed you to all of a sudden become a two-way defenseman there was it mm-hmm. was it was it was a couple of players taking you under their wing because all of mm-hmm. a sudden you saw that offensive yeah. side of your game start to develop and all mm-hmm. the other skills come out yeah so at that time i already had different agent matt cater and, and who's here with us we'll yeah. get him so on we're gonna a little get bit. him on yeah. and tell all the, the i call him bob sugar super agent <laughs> matt cater and i i'm kind of like asking him like when it happened like is this good like i don't know like is this good i'm being traded i i, I guess i'm not wanted but i guess i'm wanted on the other side it's like no this is really good you know you'll see ottawa it's gonna be different style different it's not gonna be just off the glass and i'm like okay so i came to training came in in, in ottawa and right from the get-go go go jump jump you know support the attack i'm looking at what what do you want from me like so Jacques that Martin, different that different x and o's were much more detailed every 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 aspect of the game was broke down to the details so you knew exactly where to be how to play positionally uh better and but most importantly it was encouraging me to play more offensive game which to me was like oh hold on like and and I remember exactly that was like a first or second pregame uh, preseason uh, game, and I'm kind of we break out the puck and I'm kind of like straight legged and I'm watching what they're gonna do and Jacques Martin is screaming, "Go go!" And I'm like, "Go where?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> so like I did like, play center. Go support the attack, right? I got the four checkers beat with the pass, and then so I start you know skating. He's like, "Yeah yeah yeah," you know. All of a sudden, it's like they're encouraging me to play offense, to jump up, to support the attack. And then, you know, next thing, like, okay, you have a good shot. You're going to be on second power play, you know, just bombing, you know, just shoot. Bomb from, shoot from blue line, you know, like, and that kind of, again, expand, open up another, another doors for me to like, okay, I got to learn how to play a more offensive, you know, game. And so again, learning and, you know, watching. And I started, became obsessed with, Nick Lidstrom just watching his game just positioning and you know like oh it was it was so, so easy. easy to watch and I'm like okay I, I I watch every game every shift he was on the ice just picking his kind of habits positioning whether he had stick this way that way how he move on the blue line try to really uh understand 
you know how even that's it's 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 impossible to copy him or, or be like him but i tried to be myself while he was i was trying to use one of you know some of the the things he used and um yeah and i you know and i remember first time they actually put me in front of that too like all of a sudden i was oh yeah to, on the power play i remember power play. that <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah and that was first time they tried it because we were in la we were down one goal, minute left in the game, and Jacques, like, power plays, like, no, he took somebody off the ice, put Z in there, and we scored. I scored. Right in front of me. First, first time they tried it. So all, <laughs> all of a sudden, like, uh, you know, it was a big article next day in Ottawa, uh, son of Ottawa season, trying in front of this, you know, Jacques Martin, smartest coach, you know, boom, boom. Now, they had the option to use me in front of a net or on the... Um, uh, on the blue line, but they also had red and two, right? So it was so like they had reds. You know, it's so all your it center was... iceman experience coming back <laughs> full circle. Yeah, but Alfie played back uh, on the power play. I remember it was uh, uh, Alfie and Reds on the first PP, and then all of a sudden that spot on the second was wide open. So I was playing on the second, you know, PP. Sometimes I played the first PP. You know, it was just d different combinations, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was, it was great. And you started then. I think that's when you started twenty five minutes a game, twenty seven minutes a game, and you must have just loved it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I can't complain. I yeah. was, uh, I was happy there. I was uh, in a rotation. I was, you know, frequently being used, and uh, you know, I took a lot of, a lot of pride to play. That's the kind of like time when I start playing real detail attention to playing certain guys because that was my job okay they told me you're gonna play this line this guy top line top player you know and i start again that was not a step right try to watch him play his habits you know skills toe drags what they did what they didn't like you know and i became real a student of the game because i just i loved you know learning how i'm gonna be defending you know different type of guys plus on top of that like worry about guys like biz right it's like you know, oh, yeah right I, yeah fucking so, chirping me from the bench <laughs> yeah so no it was it was a uh, humbling but at the same time um it was such a, a motivation to like okay like i have these responsibilities the team relies on me i i'm becoming more a leader in in a way of of playing a certain way to help my team win Oh. Yeah, you didn't and, want and, to take advantage of that. I was just going to ask, did anybody tell you to watch Lidstrom's shifts? Like, was that like an advice that maybe Jacques Martin had given you, like mm. one of the players? Because, I mean, like, obviously a, a smart move to watch one of the greatest of all time yeah. do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure somebody mentioned, like, you know, there's certain guys you watch closely. You know, they they, they, they play, you know, these big, big minutes and they play always top lines on Chris Pronger, you know, like there were, there were different guys, but I just – came to kind of like a realization that Nick has something that obviously is so unique and so intelligent that that I didn't need, need more Chris Pronger. And don't get me wrong. Yeah. How, you know, obviously one of the best defensemen play the game. But I, I thought, okay, like I have enough meanness. I, I'm physical. I, I need something more that needs to complete me more, right? Like, so so that's why I chose to have a little bit of more skill intelligent smart you know type of player who who kind of had that and i i chose watching that more than more a guy who's physical who is mean who's you know like i i just want to add more to what would be good for me i love how you said when you were younger that it was just like kind of immediate goals in front of you so i don't know if it ever came to a point in Ottawa where you realized like holy shit like the games become easier to me like did you ever realize like, wow, I, I haven't made it in a sense, but like I'm playing a number one role now. Like it must have been cool to feel some sort of relief. Like it's all come together a little bit. Right. And you're and you're in the same conversation for the Norris. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. like, like do yeah. you remember a moment or a season when you're like, holy shit, like the game is a little easier for me than, than it had been? I would not say easier, but. I came to realize that I'm entering a part of my career or a time where I'm becoming a star, <laughs> not star, but a force, a, yeah. a, a difference maker. Right. Like, yeah. I, I started noticing like, okay, like I can change this game by me being me. Yes. I can, I can add, I can just, I can do things that then I can d dictate. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's when you started having like realization, like, okay, like I can take this game over. I can take control. 
not in a bad way that selfishly goes do something no, no. stupid, but in a way that if I do this to him or I make the pass to the, you know, or if I fight this guy, I can change the momentum. I can, I can add, I can put like real difference uh, footprint on the game whether that would be momentum or, or doing some different type of things, right? So I always take a lot of pride in being very fit and always prepared physically. And I think that that was one of the things that, that I realized that if I do that, that will never be causing me... You always make mistake, right? Like you're human, by like playing because you're trying, you're trying to make a right play. It's going to be happening, right? You're going to make mistakes. But I never try to make mistake because lack of uh, conditioning yeah. or fatigue, right? And that that was kind of like, I think for me, the biggest difference because I took so much pride that I'm not going to be making mistakes or or doing something, you know, that it's going to be causing us game. Like as a lack dessert. of- <laughs> no, not that. I ate a lot of desserts, but, but being fatigued or being not conditionally a good enough prepared for for the game or or the season right i don't yeah. know if you, if you i know exactly it's just, it's just i was like okay like that will not play a role if my if i make mistakes gotta be basically you know somebody either you know, against me made a really good play defensively or you know hats off he he was really good it won't be lack of preparation though yes you also had uh, your first taste of the playoffs with auto were you surprised at the the huge increase in intensity when the playoffs rolled around yeah yeah, I was. I'm not gonna lie. I was. Wow, this is this is different because obviously now you're dealing with a lot more emotional emphasis on every shift of every game. Uh, you know the pressure. It's just a, it's just a different animal, right? Like so, so you know, experiencing you know those uh, uh, series against Toronto, like they were bigger, stronger, physical, more physical against us, and we were obviously a very skilled team, uh, but noticing like okay playoffs is a different animal because it's just a uh, clutch and grab back then just like very heavy and, and all of a sudden you realize like okay like this is not always about the best skill team but it's a grind right it's just a every shift grind and they you know got best of us um every year did you have to adjust your game much when, when the playoffs came around and if so how long did it take you yeah i mean it's it's a marathon um so now you're like dealing with knowing that, okay, you're going to play the same team uh, possibly seven times, right? So it's a, you know, you, you have to realize how you manage the game, how to man- how, how you manage the series. It's not about just one period or one shift. It's it's not about one game. It's like, okay, we, we, we just got to kind of like stay even keel. Like all those emotions, you start realizing you have to learn how to uh, handle them. Um, so that was that was something uh, quite learning. No, no, you turned into like this force, like you're mentioning, and, and you're a team first guy. But at some point, it comes up like Redden and your deal was ending at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's it, it's like, am I going to be here? Did you start wondering like, wow, I don't know if I'm going to continue to be here? Did you want to stay a senator? Like, how did that all go about when free agency finally came? Yeah, I mean, um, of course I wanted to stay, um, but we. Um, we, I say we, Matt, Matt, Kira, and my, myself, we, we, we realized that the, the lack of communication between the management and us, uh, became quite, quite obvious. Yeah. And we, we saw it coming. It was kind of like, okay, because of the salary cap, because of the decision to, to keep probably only one of us, um, kind of play a big role. And, you know, obviously, you know, we realized, right after the season that it's not going to happen. Yeah. Now, was Boston a spot right away you'd look to? Like, how did it come about when, when, when July 1st came? Yeah. So that's that's a good question, probably. That would be also good to bring Matt with, uh, with us. But I didn't know what to expect. Obviously, that was the first time I, I would be, um, I'll be a free agent, right? Yeah, uh, unrestric- UFA. Uh, yeah. UFA, unrestricted free agent. And what was Matt really good at? Uh, he said, look, like, you you need to um make a chart of of a teams and and prepare because it's gonna come and it's gonna come very fast not like in these days that you can travel to the cities and and visit the teams see the facilities do do the interviews prior to your decision back then it was like okay july 1st is the 
it's uh, opening the Uf, uh, UFA market and you have five minutes. You know, yeah. you're going to have uh, 10 offers on the table and uh, 12 or five, uh, they're all going to say, we want to have your answer back because if you're not going to go with us, we're going to go and move on and sign somebody else. So that, w- that was tough. So so uh, probably, Matt, you can add to that. But it was, it was to me, it was like... Overwhelming. Absolutely. Yeah. I was like, how can I make decisions on my future like in five minutes? <laughs> like, this is crazy. Yeah, so what, so what, what we did is we tried to create uh, we did all of our work ahead of time. You know, we wanted to be prepared. Like we try to with, you know, anytime you have a free agency or a player movement, you've got to be prepared, over-prepared, I like to be. And so what we did is we created a chart where we put all the teams on the left side of the Excel sheet and on the top, we created a criteria. Like what are we looking for in, in an organization? Stanley Cup, opportunity. And we look at the coach, we look at the GM, we look at the city and you kind of like grade each one a, B, and C. And we rated basically everyone that made sense, basically. And, you know, through time, I think we were able to kind of narrow it down to three to five teams. And, um, you know, so we knew going in that what we had an idea of three to five teams, hopefully, that we'll call and that we can deal with. And, you know, I, I think in the end, um, there was LA, uh, New York Rangers. And uh, Boston were like three three of the teams that, that Tro- we Toronto was there. I Toronto think, was Washington. there. Oh, yeah. geez. Well, they saw uh, what you done yeah. to them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was pushing Arizona, but you know, sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, Phoenix, you know, hang out with Biz. Yeah, Let's yeah, go, yeah. yeah. You know. uh, anyway, if you had been there, I'm sure he would have done it. Um, you know? Is there any truth to the season before that they actually tried to make a move, but uh, and is Scatcher, Dave Scatcher, was involved in the trade, and because of his community ties, I think that was with the Islanders, right? Yeah, yeah that's what the Islanders. That's what the Islanders trade him. Yeah, they, oh, okay. They, we're gonna trade. When did you guys start working together? We we start we started working together. I think in '98 or '99 range. Uh, he was interviewing other agents, and and I caught wind about it. And Michael Hanzus, who's a longtime client of mine, you know, kind of hooked us up. And I, it was a Monday. I'm minding my own business, and I remember talking to talking to Z, and and he's like. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for a new agent. Are you interested? I go, how about lunch tomorrow? <laughs> you know, hey, nothing else going on. Fucking right. You know, I was like, you know, he was about a six, number six, seven defenseman, you know, at the time and and uh, off the glass and out. He did well, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and so we, we just basically, I just, he was, I think he was like, whoa. And I jumped on the uh, a car the next morning, drove down and went to his house. He had the off day and met him and Tatiana's wife. And we spent, I don't know, five hours together, six hours together. And at the end of the meeting, he gave me this four or five page letter that he had written, like basically what his career meant to him, how much hard, you know, this is written letter, how, how hard he wanted to work. Um, I think at, by the end of the day, I think he wanted to go with me, but it was really nice. Like he, I wish I still had this letter. How do you not, you goon? I know, I know, I know. No, what was I thinking? Could be read at you the know? Hall of Fame and done. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking this. Yeah, yeah I, like, I can remember some of the quotes, but it was really touching because it was all about like how much this career means to me, how hard I worked, and everything else. And and you know, I think the big thing that that families and players need to get out of this interview and get out of Z's journey uh, is not not just how hard he worked, but that this is a journey, not a race. Yeah. You know, he was never in his mind elite. Like so many of these parents are trying to climb over each other, try to get their kid there early, get yeah. there. You always, they always want to be the first one there. The idea is not to stay the first, to be the first one there. It's to stay the longest. Marathon, not a sprint, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think he's the epitome of that, you know? And I think at various points along the way here, he put a chip on his shoulder and was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to prove everyone wrong. Yep. He remembered the the, the coach that cut him. You know, from that team, it's no different than Brady. Brady does the same thing. Yep. You know, Brady for years had that chip on his shoulder. You know, and and w- what is he going to do to uh, to prove everybody wrong? And I think that that's fueled Z for years, wouldn't you say, Z? Definitely, it's a uh, it's something that I use as a motivation. Um, you know, I think that at the end, like you know, all these disappointments and and challenges are, you know, only. Uh, only information, right? If 100% information, if you use it in the right uh, mindset and use it for something positive and something good, right? Like you can either quit or 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 you can just give up and be mad, be frustrated, be, be whatever, depressed. 
Or you can say, you know what, like, I, I, I still believe in myself. And whether it's going to come something out of it as a, as a you know, 25 year uh, career, or it's going to be the greatest 25 days of my life. Like, uh, I mean, it's a, it's just the way you look at it. I, I know everybody wish to have amazing long, and I wish everyone long, successful career, but probably not, it's not going to happen. But I think that the, the approach should be like, look, like, doesn't matter what he thinks. If I believe in myself and I still going for it, then you should. I mean, yeah. you never know. Like who would knew that when you started the podcast, like it yeah. was for fun, right? Look at now, like you guys have probably the most listeners, viewers, uh, you know, sponsors, like it's, it became huge. But you, you probably thinking like, okay, like all these people, like, you know, thinking, what am I starting? Like, yeah, it's great. I did. Like, congrats. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. You guys have it. I mean, it looks I like still don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Yeah, 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 I think you do. I think you do. I mean, he asked me that on the way down. Yeah, I mean, I what is this doing? <laughs> He's got zero credibility. How the fuck does no, that? I mean, it's, like? a, it's it's amazing what, what can be accomplished, right? Like yeah. it, it just starts from basically nothing, but but it just all of a sudden it's a great great thing. And, right? and so. I think I think it was what drove you too is like I'm gonna max out my career. Like yeah. I'm going to do what I can to maximize this career. And, and I think a lot of that, you know, going back quickly to Ottawa before we talk about the free agency thing is you were going to do whatever it takes to max it out. Like this guy, he'd work out in the mornings before practice. He'd work out after practice and then he'd work out at night. And, you know, he was going two or three times a day in order to max it out. And then he'd try to drag teammates along with him. He had a great rapport with Danny Heatley. You know, and uh, I used to watch these guys go back and what forth. What was the bartering? He, he would go train with them if he enjoyed a six pack. Or... <laughs> tell him about, you know, he, he like, I don't know. You tell. I, I can't remember. I, I mean, all. these guys like literally would be after games and, and Z would be chirping them, you know, and he'd be like, Danny, come on, let's go. Let's go work out. He'd be like, no, Z, no, I'm going to I'm going to the bar with the boys. You know, <laughs> it was just classic. The kind of yeah. the interplay yeah, you know, yeah. between the between the, the two. When you, when you signed with Boston back to that that summer, was yeah. it was it told to you at the time of the offer like you were going to be captain? Because that was pretty cool. Right. And I don't know if that was intimidating or overwhelming, but it must have been exciting for you thinking, am I ready or I am ready mm -hmm. to be a captain? Obviously, we didn't know who's going to. You know, uh, uh, we kind of had idea. Matt had some small conversations uh, with the teams, and they said, "But you never know till they actually send the offer, right?" Yep. And then once once we had uh, you know multiple teams, then then it became kind of like a okay a process, like which we already kind of like did the uh, pre work, and uh, I was looking for the opportunity to um, be a leader. Okay, like I I didn't have any, anything. Nothing was guaranteed. Um, but I knew that Peter Shirelli was going from Ottawa to Boston as a GM. Okay. So I knew, okay. So he knows me. He knows who I am, what kind of a player, what kind of character I am. Um, there was obviously captaincy was, was, was vacant, but to me, it was, um, I got a call from Ray Borg, some, you know, uh, former players uh, telling me, you know, about the organization and about the opportunity to, to and, and they all said the biggest need was changing the culture. And, and, and I said, you know what, I'm going to embrace it. Like, I, I can't tell that I was comfortable because it's a, it's a huge challenge and it's a huge amount of responsibility but I was excited, like you said, it's an original six franchise. It's a beautiful city. And I saw the opportunity and to grow. But I also, you know, I also know that to be able to grow, you can't be comfortable. It, those two do, don't coexist. It's gonna be uncomfortable. And I, I gotta knew, make it that way. And I gotta, I gotta obviously be myself, be, be a leader who I am. And uh, it's gonna be some sort of, uh, uh, constructive uh, criticism and, and implementing the passion, the energy and vision that, that I had through discipline, determination, desire to win. And uh, that's, that's, that's when we signed. I signed with, uh, with the Boston. And so that first year, it was a little bit of a struggle, right? For the bees, would you guys, and, and at that same time, Ottawa was still playing real well. Was that hard or you just knew going in, this is, this is what has to happen? 
It's a process. Like yeah. I, as much as everybody would love to see uh, the change right away first year, it's not going to happen. You have a new GM, you have new coaching staff, you have new free agents. It was me, me and a number of guys. Mark Savard came in. It was like, so everything was kind of like finding way. The pieces were all over the place and we, we were just kind of like finding the right fit and like I said, it was it was a responsibility that I took maybe too hard at first because I was trying to um, obviously make a difference right away and change. But it, it just takes time, you know. Like it's not gonna be built overnight, right? And it's 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 a process that you kind of watching players how they behave, you know, making sure that you're setting the right attitude, you know. Like you kind of uh, have to at certain time just watch and listen instead of you know having too much words and it's it's all kind of took time and after that first year obviously it was disappointing because everybody's expectations like oh we have a, this yeah. free agent signing we have a new coach we have a new gm let's go oh, we should be winning stanley cup right and in a demanding city in it terms is. of fan we'll base city and, and rightfully the fans still wait you know at that time they're still waiting right they, they're passionate they're still waiting and and Obviously, now I've been named captain, and it's like I'm taking a, I'm taking a lot of that that weight yeah. on my shoulders. But it's it's a learning, it's a learning, and and after that first year, it was more changes. We we brought uh, Claude Julian, and 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 that kind of like brought more stable, sta stable uh, in our game. And uh, you know, had conversation with him. You know, I don't want you to worry about this, that, that you know, just play the game. You know, like so it was it was. Uh, yeah, and not not a learning. Yeah, and and I, I sorry before you go. No, no, no. I'm curious, like guy like uh, I played with Pronger, he was this way. Joe Thornton, I've heard, almost at intermission, they're like, "Hey, need more out of you." Like, were you a guy that's telling guys, "Hey, that first period wasn't good enough"? Were you calling out teammates in a sense that, like, we need you to wake up? Yeah, it yep. was needed, and um, yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, like I said, it was a uh, uh, confrontations. Um, you know, it was. Uh, not being uh, 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 um, picking on guys, but letting them know that this this is this got to be better. We got to be better. You know, if you're not, you know, doing your job, then you know everybody else is suffering because of that. So, like I say, we 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 were kind of like weeding out. I guess if you want to say it, like guys who who are in and who are out. Yeah. So you kind of like you 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 start like monitoring like okay like, but the biggest thing for me was. I tried to put a lot of emphasis on uh, get, getting rid of the com complaining, you know, okay. making excuses. That was that. That was to me was like as soon as I saw that, I was like on guys. But I tried to really set the the standards or or, or you know changing culture by by being me. Basically, I came to training camp and I said I'm gonna be the the strongest, the fittest guy. And I'm gonna let everybody know that, because that's a standard. I want to set the standard, so everybody's gonna be like, "Oh shit!" Like, okay. Second, I talked about it, the attitude, and and bring that attitude in the practice. So we start practicing hard. Yeah, you know. And I had great help of Patrice and and Glenn Murray and PJ Axelson at that time. So they were they were very helpful because we start practicing differently. I started to play as hard in the practice, or even harder than in the games. So yeah, it happened. There were some some fights in the practice, but again, you're setting some sort of like a, a footprint that okay, this is gonna change, and we're gonna change it, and we're gonna do it together. And if, who is in, he's in; who is out, he's out. So that's kind of what was happening. And then we added more guys with character. Sean Thornton came in. Luch kind of brought you know the, the his presence. You know, uh, Nate Horton, Boychuk, Ferran, Sidemary. We we start adding pieces and guys who play with a lot of heart. Yeah, you know, and and all of a sudden it was like, okay, now we have, we have foundation, we have that culture foundation, and we just started to like making improvements, right? And and obviously, Claude was a big part of that. Peter was, you know, making good good deals. So um, quickly, the the craziest story I heard from you mentioned camp coming in as the strongest guy. So a lot of times there's a test of pull ups. So people who don't know, um, you know, you got to straighten the arms so they don't count. At one time I did eleven. That was my max. I was told you did 33 with your shirt off at your height. Like, do you remember that? Like, guys just, I remember people telling me, everyone's just sitting there watching this guy do 33 pull-ups. I remember that was the first training camp. And I remember John Whitesides, our strength conditioning coach, walking up to me right before I went on. 
he's like please don't embarrass me make you make sure your, your arms are straight and uh, i'm like don't, don't worry. you worry Johnny. Don't worry. just brother. count him just count him <laughs> <laughs> and, and then yeah I, I got off i got off and i could see i could see like guys were like shit <laughs> oh, I, fuck. and then you know what and that was okay like i don't like to show off i don't like to do that but again it was a purpose behind yeah. it right like and going years back that purpose paid off because whatever six seven years later i end up being fifth really? which is which is i was like okay of course i would like to keep winning it but i end up being fifth with 39 pull-ups so we had guys who caught up and start doing and i was like now we have it this is yeah. great yeah there Fucking right. it worked now, it worked we, we we have something we are the best conditioning team which we were we were the strongest fastest skilled like we were toughest we were we had what we wanted to build we had the culture now z you also if i'm not mistaken been the uh, word rookie from the locker room and you kind of put away with any sort of hazing adjacent things shenanigans i guess what, what was it that made you just come to that decision like we got to get rid of this stuff uh probably what i dealt with uh at, at a very young age um you know growing up we we you know it, it i don't want to talk about the details but it was quite the bullying was part of growing up maybe back home a little bit and i said one day if i ever have a chance to change it i'll i'll make sure i change it i i don't like to do it i i don't like to put anybody down i'd like to um embarrass anyone um you know um i think i think that um uh, you gotta realize that you know, if you point finger at somebody, there's, you know, three, four fingers pointing back at you. So I just, I just didn't like it. I, I, I know that it was, you know, it was probably used. It was not like, okay, this is going to completely get, you know, out of they the still got to pay for rookie dinner though. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but, but, but I try to be very respectful and try to help uh, young players to, to, to actually feel comfortable because regardless of the games or the age, we are on the same team. How you expect somebody play hard for you if you're going to be mean to him or disrespectful? It is ass him. backwards. The you, whole, you, you got to You got to realize like once you're on the ice, you're on the same team, you wear the same shirt, you're teammates. Like why would you act differently off the ice or in practice and then all of a sudden expect the guy like, okay, like give me the puck or block a shot for me because I made a mistake. Like, you know, like it's got to be some bonds, got to be some, you know, a strong team uh, structure. And, and so I, I, I didn't like it. You know, you, you start, like you said, building this culture in Boston, the team's getting better. You got new guys coming in and then you have that that Philadelphia series, right? You're up 3-0 and then up 3 nothing in game seven, you lose. Anything said to the team or that summer, anything you thought about, like this is never going to happen again, we're going to win a Stanley Cup. Like was that a changing factor in how things went? That, that was series. probably the biggest, um, biggest learning we could all get. Because we, at that point, we had that team. You had a chance that year, yeah. We, we were, we were there. We were um, the team that we felt like, okay, we are built to win. But we let off the, the guy, you know, the 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 foot off the pedal. Like we 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 took it easier, and that was learning for us. That was the biggest learning for us, and that was probably the best learning we 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 could have got that. It's never over till it's over. Almost had to happen. And almost had to cup. happen. And I think if you if you look at back, um, you know, all these teams that won championships, at some point prior, they have some sort of a big upset, something that happens to them that makes them, you know, it just it just gives them the energy and gives them that that extra, uh, uh, you know, that, that pissed off and kind of like, okay, yeah. we will. Look at we, Colorado. We want to. Look at Washington. Yeah. We, we All just, of them. We, it's payback. Tampa. It's, Tampa. it's not, you know, something that you're going to say, now it's our turn, right? Like, mm -hmm. obviously that came next year. I want to know some of these, uh, maybe these some stories that you remember about Z that he doesn't remember. He was too focused on uh, the conditioning and winning Stanley Cups. What are the funny things that were going on behind the scenes with this man? Uh, I mean, Honestly, like people see Z and he's this stoic, you know, guy, but he's not. He's one of the funniest guys <laughs> I've ever dealt with. I mean, honestly, it's like pure comedy, you know, like just watching him interact with his teammates, how he like what he's talking about, too, on the, you know, in, in terms of the culture with practice and everything else. He also did it away from the ice. You know, I've I've watched him over the years, whether it was like we talked about Danny Heatley interacting with him or I remember 
you know, him running into Marchie in the North End because we'd be walking around and, you know, Marchie would be pushing a baby carriage and Z would be like, is that for you or your poor kid? <laughs> you know, just like, just some great chirps, you know, yeah. that he's got. And, you know, sometimes you, they don't see that, but that that's what brings teams together. Like all of my clients that I have, you can see that tight teams are the ones who get along well off the ice. And I think he's not only just the practice and the work ethic, but it's the fun that he has with these guys. You know, and and I watched it later with with uh, Washington, the Islanders, when I had clients there, and they call me up and they'd be like, "Oh my God, this guy's funny," you know, like because they didn't know him, you know, and as that. So, you try to be funny? No. Well, going to watch like or or it's it's a different role now. Okay, like I guess if I look back, maybe I, I wish I I could done more of that, being more looser and more open. But I guess as your career I went know, on, I, you I just that I just yeah. felt like the responsibility and the it, it, it was something I had to carry all the time, twenty four seven, and uh, that's that's the way I was, and that was me, and that was the I I I didn't want to fake it. I didn't want to be faking some stuff that that um, you know would kind of be obvious. I just listen, like I I am who I am. Yeah. Um, at that time, it was the best. Probably it, it was a great balance between me and Bergy, right? Like Patrice is just a. a uh, unbelievable leader, unbelievable human being, person, you know, outgoing. Uh, but it was it was great for me to have him because he was the what I wasn't, right? And 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 we were, and I said it, we were co captains. Like it was not that I was the guy and everybody else. Like I I I welcome to have guys on the leadership group, and we had probably five six guys making decisions together. Because that's that's I shared the leadership because I wanted to have guys input right. I, I included Sean Thornton, Mark Recchi, Ferentz. I put guys in because that was great. Like I I couldn't make calls or write calls all the time. Yeah, and it's always better to have you know uh, other guys saying me like, hey, why don't we try this? Yeah, fuck right. Like that's that's great. Like I I I enjoy that. You know, and and you know Patrice was such a you know tremendous you know my wingman for. 14 years. Ah, uh, we gotta get to 2011, of course. Uh, during that run, you know, you guys were down 0-2 to Montreal, go to seven games with them, down two to Vancouver. Uh, was there any moments of doubt whether you personally, the guys in the room, maybe not talking about it, but you know, it was kind of a little hairy there. You yeah, the and like, on the road. and after the the Vancouver 0-2, was there something you said? Was there something anyone said to, to really get this thing going again back in Boston? Yeah, the biggest biggest help for us was to to have Mark Recchi and Sean Thornton with us. Because they they won it, and I believe Mark Recchi was in the same position with Carolina, being down 0-2. Don't know against who, but was uh, it Edmonton? Would have been Edmonton. Yeah. Might have yeah. been. And yeah. he said, "Guys, like I I've been there. Like we okay. Like just just he spoke probably the most, which was awesome to have because none of us been been there. And 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 again, we were like." just going off that philadelphia yeah. right and he was like here we go again like no way this is happening again and 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 he was such a calm factor for us and just build the confidence back up to us um so all the credit and kudos go to to those two guys because they really handle it well for us to kind of like stay calm we're gonna go to montreal we're gonna take first game and we're gonna break it down to first period second period third period first period first shift second shift third shift and that's how we broke it down literally shift by the shift we couldn't believe it it was just like just these short goals and one at a time and we we, we tied the series and obviously then ended up winning game seven but um to have again experienced guys who's been there who won and and just to keep that group and that team um you know steady and not panicking and and it was huge. were you the type of guy who would get nervous before games and, and and if not were you nervous before that game seven yes i i always got nervous before the games but not nervous scared but nervous just just excited nervous right and the only game i was not nervous was my first NHL game going back to 19 
97. I, 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 I don't know why. Maybe just so excited. <laughs> I was just like, okay, like, what what I have to lose? Like, yeah. Detroit Red Wings, uh, Stanley Cup champions. <laughs> oh, here you go. Federov, uh, Lindstrom, Lariano. Minus oh, four. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, I've been plus two that game. Oh, okay. Shit. Suck on that. Yeah. 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 I've yeah. never Wait. been plus You're not yeah. talking about yourself. <laughs> he has no, a game sheet at home. I have a game sheet that I play like less than 10 minutes, but, but we, we won actually 3 1 that game. Uh, but uh, yeah, since then, Every game, I got some butterflies. I was like nervous. Like I was just like, uh, you know, just serious. I was just very serious and always kind of ready for the game. And and uh, because you know, I'm facing the best players in the world. That's my task. Like that line, that player. It was just, I never felt comfortable enough to be going into the game like, oh, this is gonna be easy. Because as soon as you start doing that, you're pff, done. You like minus three in first period. Like yeah. you just not. But not. but you. One of the things I was interesting and i pass this on to younger players is that you take it all as a business so when he played against marion hosa or michael hansus he'd run them yeah and i remember saying to you after games i'd be like why are you running michael or why are you running hosts like do you, you're not friends with him anymore he goes mat mat this is a business <laughs> <laughs> and, and, no and I'm friends like, out there and i'm like keep hitting because we have our breaks <laughs> let's keep the play it's going yeah. yeah they keep those stats yeah. now buddy <laughs> and then he then he, he literally you come this isn't even like, in ottawa i gotta tell us he, he comes out he goes they missed three hits <laughs> can you talk to somebody yeah, 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 about yeah. this you missed three hits i'm like oh my god the arb case we're out the window <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Panic you know. no you need to be in madison square garden they just hand out hits yeah, there for me, I was like, they missed a few shifts. <laughs> <laughs> um, back just quickly to uh, the the cup year. Was the hit on, on Horton? Was that a like? I just I remember being at the game. It was right in front of where I was sitting and seeing your 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 boy laying down like that. Was that kind of a a big rallying cry for you guys? Yeah, definitely. I think that um, I believe that was probably most intense and probably most watched. That was crazy. Uh, one of the most uh, watched, uh, you know, Stanley Cup finals because there was so much stuff happening, but. Definitely, like one of the most favorite guy, guys uh, in the locker room, and and probably one of the better guys we had. You know, he's scoring. You know, the the OT. He guys actually, he's got game winning against uh, against Tampa, game winning against uh, uh, Montreal. Uh, Montreal. Right? So he, he is a guy who's making like difference, like and being blowed out like that, and and um, so definitely it, it gave us uh, the extra motivation because it was just like, you, you hate to see your teammate laying down and being out like that, so, and especially after a hit like that, so. Well, a after the celebration on the ice of Vancouver, you guys all go in the locker room, I might have been in there too, but all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> he was not good. You were there? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I was in there. Yeah. Right, he was. I was in there. You, yeah, uh, you poured beer into his mouth. Like a boss he, was sports. he was a creepy dude in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, well, it, what was crazy was there was a riot going on a mile down the street and uh, yeah. you know, you're know, you having this great celebration. I remember one of the, the team officials came in and said, everybody, we got to get out of here. There's a riot down the street. The plane's waiting. That, that must have been pretty crazy for you guys to like have to screw kind of quick because there was a, a riot going on. Yeah, we were first thinking somebody's joking, right? Like, okay, like, what what, what do you mean there's riot? Like, okay, there, there's probably upset fans, this and that. But then they said, no, there's actually like – uh, cars on fire, uh, uh, the streets being shut down, the the stores being broken. Uh, you know, literally, there's you know, lack of control of the you know, I guess the police, all that stuff. So uh, they eventually said, okay, we gotta leave. And then when it's coming from our guys, from PR guys, like literally, like we have to leave the city. So the families had to um, uh, uh, get on the bus, go to the their plane. And, you know, we were, you know, getting undressed, you know, and then quickly you know, moving again the same direction. So, uh, yeah, it was crazy. Like, uh, then we watched it, obviously, news and what was happening. It was quite, uh, yeah, surprising that this would actually be part of the, you know, it was kind of sad to see. Yeah, you're like, we got 150 grand to spend at Foxwoods. We got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, was that your credit card, Z, that they put it on? I don't know whose credit card. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, we landed in Boston. And um, besides two guys, all of us were obviously first time. So we didn't know what to do. And obviously, as a captain, they we went to the airport, you know, uh, people waiting. It was great to see, you know, park in front of the garden, the crowd there. You know, and then they're like, okay. And I'm having the cup. I'm like, what am I doing with it? Like, it's like, yeah, take it. So, you know, they have a car service for me. So I get in the car and there's cars following me. And I see helicopter. Then I live on the water, right? So there's a boat coming and parking in front Paparazzi. of the... 
uh, boats coming in front of uh, uh, my apartment, and I'm like, this is this is something, right? The neighbors coming, everybody's like trying to take pictures, and so we obviously nobody slept. But uh, then I you gotta, go to TS, and uh, so Andy uh, fans, you know, we had probably ten guys living in North End. We all gathered. Uh, our kids, our families, and went. We went on the building on the rooftop, and we took some beautiful pictures of uh, of uh, that morning, beautiful sunny day, and and uh, with the background of the city. And then uh, uh, we took the cup in a baby stroller because it was heavier to carry through the whole north end. And he brought like a baby stroller, like he put a cup there, and we just uh, we took a TS and we were, we we took a different uh, restaurants and bars and. So we had fun with it. Yeah, it was uh, it was nice. Ah, uh, I hate to go there, but the 2013 Cup versus Chicago, you guys banged up your battle, and Game Seven looks like it might happen. Like, how did it just kind of slip away so quickly? I honestly, that was like, w- that felt like a one punch knockout. Like we were all thinking, okay, we got this. Like, okay, just finish the game. Like, control it. You know, defend the lead. Boom, one. Boom, two. Boom, over. <laughs> Like we were shocked. We were shocked. Like we were in locker room. We didn't know what happened. It just happened so quickly. And yeah, literally everybody. And talking to Hossa after, it's like we were all thinking, like, okay, like game seven, like, you know, we're gonna go back to Chicago, we're gonna play game seven and, and we play really well in Chicago and, and when that happened we were all RA stunned. says RA says if he was coach, you would have called the timeout after the first one to, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. to regroup they, things. Yeah, you know, I, it, I would, it, yeah. It, 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 honestly I can't even like tell you what happened because till today I, I didn't watch the game. I never blocked it out. I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, no, that's okay. <laughs> I, but I mean good way to just, end the interview, yeah. RA. <laughs> but I I, 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 I can tell you like we were all sitting there just done laughter nobody said a word it was just like and you know we kind of pretty much knew that with the salary cap the business side that was the last time we had that team together it would be yeah. it would be movements it would be different things would be happening so and it did and um yeah so that was said to see kind of a knowing kind of in, a, in the back of your mind that okay this is the this is it for this group. Right. I, I just got to ask, too, about, you know, 19, obviously, too, but you break your jaw and everyone's like, holy shit, what's going to happen? Now, was there anything that was going to stop you from playing that game? I mean, you were back out there, you had the face shield on, but was there a chance they were going to say, like, no, you can't play? Do you remember how that all went down in the room the, after? The game had happened or the, uh, next- when, the next game when you came back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I tried to come back the same game, but that... that They're like, Z, no, uh No, it's... Uh, <laughs> no. So... Yeah, we we stayed overnight in St. Louis, uh, St. Louis, and uh, I didn't sleep a bit. Oh, it was just like the um, pain, bleeding pain, uh, just just kind of waiting and waiting for the morning to come. And finally, got on the plane, went right from the plane to hospital, had my surgery done. So woke up from my surgery, and I'm actually feeling pretty good. So I'm like, okay, like it's pretty like not bad. So you know. Um, you know, Don Sweeney came to see me. Cam Neely came to see me. Like, how you feel? How you feel? I'm like, I'm feeling good. Like, I think I'm gonna try to play. They're looking at me like, oh, whatever. He's still <laughs> like, you're high. He's still, yeah, he's still probably <laughs> under the uh, influences of the whatever morphine. And and um, but I'm like, I'm actually feeling pretty good. And they, you know, so now I'm talking to doctors, and they all giving me the, you know, the the cautious of of what can happen, right? And I'm like, well okay, I'm willing to take it and I want to go out there. And then, so I went for skate for a morning skate and I actually felt good. I'm like, okay, I'm feeling good. And then come, you know, the lunch comes and I'm like, how am I going to eat lunch? <laughs> so, so actually there's a blender and I'm trying to get as much in me as possible, but it's tough. It's tough to kind of like refuel after. And, um, but I, I just felt like it was the right thing to do and, and I wanted to go out there and just uh, help the team. And uh, now, Was the pain management for you just basically sucking it up? You weren't take, you weren't getting shot up or taking any, any... No, I took. I took because I had multiple other things. Oh, okay. I didn't okay. know. I, I, which I, at that time, I didn't know. I had broken elbow. I had uh, torn groin. I had uh, the jaw. But I... So I, I, I was under the, 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 the painkillers. But uh, that obviously... All, I only could t- take so much that it would be healthy, right? right so right. you still f- felt obviously the pain every time you got hit, the vibration. And, and the Bruins stuff, didn't put any pressure on you to play. Which no, was- they were actually telling me, "Look, yeah. like you, 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 you just take you know extra day. You know, we be co- you know we don't need you maybe right now. Even we we do need you, but like okay, like health is more important. Like they were very very you know good and respectful and all that. But I was it was more me that I said whatever waiver I have to sign. Yeah. 
I'll sign. I just want to go and play. Well, well this has been, yeah, I mean, this is, this is I know we've went long, but this is yeah. just like the lessons that, that so many people listening are going to learn, man. Your, your story is incredible. What you've achieved is incredible. Um, I mean, fuck, listen to you. You're motivating me to be a better person. So thank you so much for joining us thank and you, sharing Z. everything, Z. And, and thank you, Matt. Appreciate we, it. Yeah, it you, to be here. Yeah, Cater as well. And, and, we, and we wish you the best in, in your retired life. No, thank you, guys. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, like I said, you know, I, I, I listened to your podcast. It's a, it's a, it's a great show. And uh, wishing you all the best and Happy New Year to your listeners and uh, to you guys. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank yeah, you totally very much. like our hot see. takes, too. Thank McDavid's you. getting traded. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Before we go any further, I want to talk to you guys about Skip the Dishes. Don't watch the game shorthanded. Did somebody say, Skip? Who wants to cook on game night? Not me. Drop the oven mitts and give your taste buds something to cheer about with Skip the Dishes. Skip the Dishes has thousands of restaurants, including local favorites that don't normally deliver. Discover new cuisines all around you. Score some sushi, sauce your friends some spaghetti, or go top shelf with a gourmet burger, wings, pizza, or nachos. When it's time for a celly, Skip the Dishes delivers desserts like cheesecake or ice cream, even a bag of ice if you're running low. Make sure you guys also celebrate with Skip Rewards. Earn points on every order and use your points to get more of what you love. Free food. Whatever you're in the mood for, it's always a win for the home team with Skip. And if you're going to pregame, do it right. Order your favorite Skip order in time for puck drop and eat your face off. Did somebody say Skip? Man, huge thanks to Big Z for coming on with us. Like Wood said earlier, just an unbelievable interview. Just a terrific guy, too. It's like the gentle giant. Everyone calls him. He's just uh, such a perfect human being. And, of course, Matt Cade for, for making the thing happen. So hopefully everybody enjoyed that. Uh, meanwhile, back to the NHL. Some uh, tough scene in Raleigh the other night, Thursday night. Max Pacioretty, who just got back in the lineup about five games prior after rehabilitating his Achilles after surgery. Well, the poor guy tore it again. You could see it was a non-contact injury, which are typically the worst kind. He skated off. Uh, he's a 34-year-old guy, Wit. I mean, it's this could maybe be the end. You hate to say that, but just a, an awful scene that we hate to see in this league. Awful. Anytime, you know, you see somebody, and it, this is like Robbie Fa Fabry comes to mind, and it's like to see somebody come back and work so hard and then to have the same exact injury happen again, it just makes me sick to my stomach because it's like all you've done is grind and battle and mentally get through the rehab of like a pretty brutal injury. And like, if it's one thing, if something else happens, but to have the thing happen again, not only in your mind, are you thinking like, oh my God, I have to go through that again. You just have to think like, is this, am I, am I fucked? Like, it's, it's not like I hurt my shoulder or hurt my knee. It's like, this is the same exact thing. What am I going to do? I would never ex count him out and, and think that this would be the end of his career. Just right now, you feel so bad for a guy and you feel bad for a team in which is buzzing, looking yeah. like another uh, another year of being a Stanley Cup contender to add this guy in who gets three goals in four games. You're like, this is the perfect addition. Brindamore said a guy who could score goals, exactly what we need. And boom, he's gone for the same fucking thing that happened before. You just feel for him and you feel for that whole team. And it just, it was a shitty thing to see. And you said it like those non-contact injuries. That's when you know stuff's bad. And and to just see him grabbing like where his Achilles is behind his leg is just horrible. Fuck now now what do they do right? You got to imagine that that money's gonna go on long term IR, so maybe they can make a move. But fuck to get a guy that can impact your lineup like that, and 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 the way that he scored goals continuously year over year, uh, yeah, heart goes out to him, man. That's fucking nasty. And those Achilles injuries, man, like the pop and just everything you have to go through and the mental grind as you touched on, it's fucking hell, man. It sucks. It's, it's, it's a shitty thing. And that's, that's a team you want to see, you like seeing different teams in the mix. That was a guy that was going to put them over the edge to potentially make a run. So let's hope they can fill that void and, and, you know, he can get back to playing at a, at a healthy state sooner rather than later. Yeah. I definitely want to wish him the best. Uh, let's see. Thir Thursday's Tampa Bay Edmonton game. They announced the rest of the all-stars for the all-star game weekend. Uh, the Atlantics, they added uh, Austin Matthews, David Pasternak, Andre Vasilevsky, Metropolitan. Those are three surprises. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the Metro added uh, Ilya Sorokin, Artemi Panarin, Adam Fox, the Central, Connor Hellebuck, Miko Rantanen, Nathan McKinnon, 
on the Pacific, Leon Dreisaitl, Stuart Skinner, and Bo Horvat. Skinner may be a bit of a surprise. The Oilers, Avalanche, and Rangers each had three players going, while the host team, the Panthers, only have one in uh, Matthew Kachuk. Uh, Carolina fans were, were pretty pissed off, like you said, because we don't really care about the snubs. I think that's more for the fans and stuff. But the, the team was funny. They actually, the Carolina Hurricanes retweeted the NHL, said, delete your account. <laughs> and like the Preds tweeted, uh, oh, interesting. So it's kind of funny to see teams trip and the, the actual NHL account about their players not getting picked. Like Matt Matt Natchez, I think was the big one with that. The the Carolina fans were pissed at, but they also unveiled the jerseys too, where they combined sort of the retro reverse thing with the conference names, which we hadn't seen since the late nineties. And it's uh basically go, goes off the shirt that Florida's first All Star game was way back in ninety four. Did you like those jerseys? What you're a fan of the bringing I them back did. or what? Uh, the 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 little pink in I think is the pink in both. The one of them I saw yeah. is pretty cool and. I remember those were the jerseys that were worn at the All-Star game I was at when Ray Bork scored the winner in Boston. One of my favorite memories with my dad, uh, skills competition the night before and then and then going to the game the next day. And um, those jerseys were sweet. And I think these look a little cooler, maybe a little more current. And it should be a fun weekend. I mean, we could be sitting here three years from now and there's no All-Star game. I'm sick and tired of talking about the snubs. If you're doing fan voting, the, the fan it's base is snub. That, it's, it's not a snub. That's how it's all being operated. They should fucking mix in some interesting. They should add the power slap to get get the get one of the skills comp or the phone seen, booth fights from Russia. F- <laughs> <laughs> you seen those? Oh, those are nuts. Well, ding, so, ding, is the ding. Po- so is the power slap. Some guys don't know how to do it where it's not doing any damage. And the other guys are just coiling and getting them busy with the fucking right at the bottom of the palm where it's it's probably worse than a punch. Oh, I actually I don't guys, know. Biz was asked. Um. This was asked to possibly be the host of the power slap show. I asked to go try out. I was asked to go to Vegas to try out to be the the who's a, who's like a Bruce Buffer Buffer. Is that the guy who announces all the boxers? And I UFC think he people? does the intros. Yeah, you would have been great at that. Oh yeah, welcome to the ring. <laughs> I turned it down, obviously, with the busy schedule, and I I was like, I don't know if I kind of want to be associated to this because it's going to be guys getting knocked out and. It's going to be a, a a bloody scene by the end of it. But what do you guys make of it so far? I've only seen the clips like online of just 300 pounders just wailing away on each other. It looks like maybe the least fun thing I could ever imagine being a part of is catching like an absolute wind up slap to the face. The one guy was standing in there and half his face was was swollen, probably out about two to three inches past where it should normally be. The whole side of his face. You could you barely think, can we his- switch to lefty. Yeah, fuck. So it's pretty dangerous. So that's why that's why I didn't want to be a part of it. I don't support violence. <laughs> yeah, it's not not something I'm, I'm going to put on, on my DVR for sure. I can kill us about you know what I'm into slap each other. I'd rather watch MILF Island than power slap competition. Have you oh. heard about this new game show? Is it Mil- I, Milf I, Manor? I saw some stuff. Is it MILF Manor? Uh, yeah, Mil- MILF Island was uh, the, the fake show, I think, on 30 Rock years ago. MILF Manor on TL- TLC, I think, is the name of this one. Oh, I, okay, I so maybe I, I got to mix up. But the 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 plot twist is, I don't, they're like, not to sound like an asshole, but there's only a few of them that are decent. They're, like, pretty old. <laughs> but I guess that they got their, their sons, and that's probably why. So all oh, the women's Jesus. sons were the guys who showed up to the island. So you're competing against other guys to crush their moms as opposed oh. to your mom getting crushed. How, how fucking pathetic does your family have to be to sign up for that? Now it also makes more sense as to why it was maybe difficult getting as many attractive girls as they they'd imagined originally because you got to get the mother daughter the 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 son mother combo you're like teresa how was my son's hog oh (laughs) great lisa it was awesome you trained him well he lasted like an extra four (laughs) minutes in bed well yeah that hog did come out of me i birthed him (laughs) what a fucked up group of people seriously i I, talk about scraping the fucking barrel once again for reality shit oh fucking oh it's it's just getting worse, worse, and worse. Oh, it is brutal. You do what oh, you do Bonnie, wonder where the bottom is. He's so good in doggy. <laughs> yeah, I know. His dad was too. Uh, I wonder <laughs> if there's going to be an incest show at some point. Oh, oh yeah, that, that's already on like Alabama public TV. Oh fuck! I mean, I, it's a t- <laughs> tough segue, and it's not something to laugh about. But other crazy shit. How about the Robin Leonard news? Oh my goodness! Oh, it's like fuck, NHL's dude. version of the Tiger King, and I feel so bad for the guy. Fuck. Yeah. All right. Cre- you want to tee us up? Yeah, kind of a, a crazy story. Uh, Robin Leonard, the Vegas goalie who's uh, on the IR right now, he had invested in a snake farm 
Well, I'm sorry. First, go back. He filed for bankruptcy, bankruptcy protection against whatever assets. But he invested in a snake farm in Missouri a couple of years back for one point two million dollars. Right. Well, the guy he was buying it off of got killed by his wife and like a, a boyfriend or something. And basically it kind of threw the snakes in the disarray. They started uh, reproducing with, without anybody babysitting them, thus devaluing the fucking value of all the snakes. They were all pythons and anacondas. Jeez. So he had a file for bankruptcy and all this information came out, but just a wild, wild story biz. I mean, when, when you read about murder, anacondas, ball pythons and, and a hockey player, it's just like, it's like a ad libs of like what kind of trash story you can put together. Yeah. I, I read the, the one article and, and I, my jaw dropped it. You know, you, you read the headline you're like, okay, there's no way it's this crazy. Um, and then you read it and you're like, oh my God. And then you're just, your heart sinks. Cause you know, Robin's been very vocal about the things that he's been through and the, and the, and the mental health stuff. And you don't want to see a guy, especially when he's injured and going through personal stuff, go through more of this type of stuff. So I don't know. I just hope he gets back on his feet. I hope that he makes an awesome comeback and all this gets resolved. And I don't know, maybe they can make a, make a funny show about it one day. Yeah, that was, that was tough to read knowing him a little bit. Um, you, you know, you never wish that to happen to any athlete. And I saw like in, in some of the lawsuits or all of them, I believe his dad is involved. So I don't know if, you know, that's his father that's making certain decisions. You know, you know, the horrific story of Jack Johnson and what his parents did to him. And you hope it wasn't a case of that, but fuck man, people just don't understand how quick money goes and how smart you have to be in terms of being an athlete. Like I remember I was lucky enough, you know, I have parents who you sign a big contract, you're 19, 20 years old. Like you, 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 there's so many people that, that, that have no guidance in terms of what to do and realizing like, Hey, you have to make this money last the rest of your life. Like it's a very short window in terms of earning power. And if you're out there spending, people don't realize like, Oh, I'm making 4 million a year. Yeah. Uh, that's 2 million. <laughs> and then you're paying, you know, all the different people in your life to do things, accountants, all these things. It's like, it's just, you got to be smart with what you have and you got to realize it has to last forever. So you never want to see something like this happen. I I, I feel bad. It's a bad There's been a couple of cases right now over the last couple of years of Vander Kane, now Robin Leonard, you probably shouldn't be taking out hard money loans. If you're playing no. in the national hockey league, I would, I would strongly suggest against that. If it's for the short term and, and you know that the capital's coming in and you can get that paid off right away, but guys, they just, fucking crush you on interest and their interest can fluctuate and it's a very very messy game so if it, for anyone out there and, and getting a bunch of money and your younger guy make sure you're consulting the right people well that's one of the things biz and i were talking about this down florida and this whole nil thing in colleges now and i mean you hear stories there's top recruits they're signing 10 15 million dollar nil deals you're like all right, is anyone telling these kids what to be doing with this money? Because if you think you've heard some horrifying bankruptcy stories from athletes before, talk to me in five, 10 years when this NIL things really become a thing and you see 19 year old uh, football players at Ohio State or wherever and they're getting 10, 15 million dollars and all of a sudden they don't have anything left and they're not necessarily going to the NFL. It's like there needs to be. I hope there's programs within the NCAA. The NCAA is run so well, too. I'm sure it's being set up correctly. I think that you need to be like teaching these guys like how to invest, what to do. The whole problem being that you can't force anyone to do stuff with their money. So, I mean, let's hope people are being smart and understanding that that this money is not going to be coming in forever. And if you play a long career and then you look back and you don't have anything, that just makes me sick. All right, moving right along here. Congrats to Ryan Miller. He had his number 30 retired by the Buffalo Sabres the other night. One of the best American goalies ever. Want to send a congrats to him. Uh, speaking of people being donkeys, man, how about Shannon Chop the other night at the, at the NBA game? Wait, oh did my you see God. this? I mean, you, you're basically probably a guest of the team if you're sitting on the court. Now, mouthing off to these guys, I mean, he's, Got to be in his 50s, talking shit to the players on the court, then saying you don't want the smoke. He had an argument with one of the guy's fathers. Like, just a kind of a donkey show, the whole thing. Yeah, I don't even know. So he was yelling at John ja Morant, correct? And then I think he was separated from John ja Morant's father. It's like, he's the host of like the bigger sh sports hot take shows, right? I mean, him and him and Skip Bayless. They're, they're always going back and forth together. And like, why are you? I don't I don't even know the backstory. Did it come out of like what happened? Or was it just all Shannon? Talking well, he, was, he was sticking up for LeBron because LeBron was was not getting the respect he deserved from the younger guys. 
on the it was the Grizzly, right? The Grizzlies, Utah Grizzlies. Yeah, I believe it was from Dylan Brooks. I believe on the Grizzlies. So they were, and and you could see Le, LeBron talking back to him. He's like, he's like, you basically need to respect me. Like, th- I think that LeBron is treated differently. Where in the latter part of MJ's career. There was nobody who would have said a fucking word to him. They were shaking his hand. They were fucking cleaning his sneakers off before the tip off for crying out loud, or maybe because of the times and maybe the, the way LeBron handles himself, that some of the other players in the league chirp him. And, and that's what was going on. And Shannon Sharp being his buddy who was sitting courtside started getting in the mix with him where it's like, buddy, just sit down and enjoy the game. Like they're like, could You're you imagine in anymore, hockey? Bud. Could you imagine in hockey, some fucking celebrity sitting on the glass? Getting in, getting into it with a couple players because they're, you know, they're chirping at each other in front of the net at the scrum. Come on, Shannon Sharp is a fucking house, though, dude. Yeah, he he's stood a up unit. on the court. I'm like, I think he would dummy any of these guys. Yeah, his chest is, yeah, he's he's a, he's a double D breast size. I tell you. Yeah, he he had a statement basically apologizing, but he also in the apology was saying, well, the, the guy should have been saying things to me. The Dylan Brooks, I think his name was. So it's like. Yeah, come on, dude. You're, you're a fucking grown ass man. Like, don't you should be talking shit. And if it was anybody else, they would have probably got tossed out. LeBron probably would have had him tossed out if, if he was talking shit. Well, that's the thing that LeBron yeah. had his back, and it was like you've yeah. gotten people tossed for doing the exact same thing. Yeah, exactly. Oh, way less, I think. Yeah, definitely way less. So I saw uh, like one of those Instagram reels. You're talking about Jordan. I don't know if it was the first time Jordan played Kobe, but it was one of the first times. And um, Jordan won and played way better. And he said to Kobe, you can wear them. You can wear my shoes, but you'll never fill them. And I guess like Kobe's teammate was telling the story and they played him again two weeks later. Kobe didn't talk to a person for two weeks, like furious, dialed in. And then like when they played again, Kobe dropped 50 on him. Oh, fucking A. That's a story. Gee, I know we got a couple notes before we go here. Well, first off, thanks to everybody down in Orlando on the East Coast League. They had the Pink Whitney night the other night. Looking good. Oh, those were oh, sick. They yeah. missed me in the uh, costume. Yeah. <laughs> they also Still have it. some uh, new Pink Whitney merch. I think Whit mentioned it at the beginning of the show. The Pink Whitney Ski Club merch is now on sale. We got big deal, new Big Deal Brewing merch on sale. Winter hats. Tons of new stuff. Barstoolsports.com slash chicklets to check it all out. I wonder if I'll get a winter hat at some point. Maybe if I keep asking. Gee, we got a video coming too. A big deal. Bruin make, uh, making a video as well. Dropping this week. Yes. On Wednesday this week, the making of big deal brewing uh, biz doing all his taste tests, going up to the factory at Labatt. Uh, basically every step of the way we've been filming. So we're going to start to uh, release that. That will come out on Wednesday. And have a terrific week, everybody. 